like to thank you for sharing your valuable time with us in this session. I know that uh, every one of us, each and every one of us are quite busy in our schedules. But uh, to be able to 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 come on board and to actually share your time uh, in this discourse session would be truly a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, inshallah, it will be a very good uh, 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 period of enlightenment for us, uh, uh, hopefully for the rest of the day. Okay, on behalf of uh, the program of Tatcha at UTM, uh, my name is uh, uh, Dr. Khairul Anwar Muhammad Kaizi. Uh, and, uh, and I'm, of course, your moderator for today. And uh, I will guide you through today's session, which is the uh, thematic webinar talk session entitled MOS Architecture, Identity, Function, or Symbolism. So in this, uh, it is a session through which we hope our subject matter experts that we have been invited, uh, the four su uh, subject matter experts that we invited, uh, may help to expound and enlighten us, particularly on the meaning, the trend, and the impact of MOS architecture throughout the modern world, uh, particularly if it involves using relevant case studies, so that will be of help, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and we have uh, uh, our invited expert panel speakers that we refer to, who are uh, architect uh, Haji Razin Mahmud, principal of Razin Architects, Sundaram Berhad, Malaysia. And we have also Dr. Urai Ferry Andi. The head of the department, Department of Architecture, Universitas Tanjung Pura, Pontianak, Indonesia. Uh, we also have uh, uh, architect Haji Azim uh, Abdul Aziz, uh, principal of Atsa Architects, Sundaran Berhad, Malaysia. And we also have finally uh, assistant professor, uh, architect Zainab Javed. Is the assistant professor at School of Art and Design and Architecture at the National University of Science, Technology and Technology uh, in Islamabad, Pakistan, or commonly referred to as NUST. Yeah, right. Okay, welcome everyone, uh, especially our invited guests, and of course the uh, the, the 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 incoming participants uh, amongst the audience, uh, and uh, the numbers are increasing. Uh, it's good to see uh, uh, good participation uh, from the audience, right? Uh, and um, further introduction to the speakers uh, will be made uh, within their before their uh, prior to their respective sessions. But before that, uh, I think it will be uh, uh, a privilege to actually begin our session in earnest. Uh, and with with that, the start of the event uh, through an opening remark by the Director of Program in Architecture at UTM, Associate Professor Dr. Alice Sabrina, Binti Ismail. All yours, uh, Dr. Alice. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kairul, as the moderator for today. So, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good, good afternoon to all the audience attending this fourth international webinar series 2022 organized by the UTM Architecture Program, University Technology Malaysia. So to all the colleagues and students we have from Indonesia, from Pakistan, Malaysia, from India, Thailand, and so many parts of the world will be joining in. Um, we from UTM, glad to meet all of you and hope that your participation in today's program will be a fruitful one. So thank you so much. I would like to be thank you again to Architect Haji Razin Mahmud from Razin Architect, Architect Haji Abdul Azim from Atsa Architect, Assistant Professor Architect Zainab Javid from National University Science Technology Islamabad, Pakistan, and also to Dr. Urai Ferifendi from Untan, Universitas Tanjung Pura. Thank you so much. Thanks again for accepting UTM invitation as our guest speakers and panelists for today. So today's webinar talk, as we all know, is actually the fourth for this year held by the UTM Architecture School. And as the director of the UTM Architecture School, I really feel honored to have these four wonderful, prominent, successful speakers, especially in the field of mosque architecture design that actually can share their interest and in niche area, focusing on the issue that we are faced by the mosque design in today's built environment. So today's webinar will actually be an eye opener to all because in the developed and well-developed Muslim and non-Muslim countries throughout the world, the issue of mosque is actually is a big challenge faced by all. 
So therefore, may I hope that the intellectual discourse today will act as a starting point to spark more discourse on mosque architecture in the 21st century. And we'll be looking at what are the best options, the best approaches for academicians and also designers, scholars and students to give their best input and idea and how to improve the functionality of the mosque, whether it will be a sacred house of worship, a house of God, or is it going to be a place for communal development for the benefit of all people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So I hope that this discourse will strengthen the ties and further development and collaboration between the practitioners, architects, and also between our international counterparts and to all students and participants who are joining in today for this today's session. So I wish everyone the very best and here is to looking forward to more collaborations and more international webinar in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you to the speakers. I hope that all the best for all of your presentation today. So Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So I pass it back to you, PM Dr. Khairul, for the next session. Thank you very much, Dr. Alice. Uh, right. Um... First and foremost, I think uh, it will be a privilege to actually introduce our respected expert speakers to you. But before we commence our proceedings with the first speaker, uh, allow me to actually explain how the session actually works, especially to all participants who have just joined us in the session through the WebEx uh, platform. Right Now, the speakers, the four speakers will be given 25 minutes each to present their topic. Uh, two rounds of Q&A and photo sessions shall be introduced each towards the end of the second and the fourth speaker sessions respectively, this prior to the end of the program at 5 p.m. Malaysian time. So it's a bit of a some housekeeping notes as well, that uh, if you were to have, uh, amongst the audience were to have any opinions, suggestions and or questions, you may post them on the chat box even as we begin our sessions for today. So I do recommend that, that you do it as a running comment. Uh, running comments uh, or, or Q&A sessions uh, uh, along the chat box, uh, 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 through the chat box. And we, we do have a talk session uh, uh, that, that will be the Q&A session proper, but it will only be for 15 minutes. So I would suggest that anybody that who has, uh, who has uh, uh, quite a serious uh, questions or queries in mind, uh, do participate early uh, through the chat box, right? Okay. A reminder to all participants, uh, please focus your participation uh, as this is important, important throughout the session. It is advisable that uh, do press on your mute button, your mute mode to prevent background noises that may distract the speakers in session and others from listening to the talk. All right. We truly appreciate your presence and uh, in, within this uh, discourse session today. Uh, and of course, we will shortly post the attendance form. Now, this is something probably of importance to many of you. Uh, we will post the attendance uh, uh, link uh, through the chat box and please fill in the Google attendance uh, form provided for our record. This will enable us to send you an e-certified or e-certification for your participation once your form is registered. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Now let's get to the to the, the serious business of, 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 of our uh, program today. Okay. Um, uh, as we have been men mentioning before, we have four experts, uh, 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 speakers amongst us, right? Uh, for the first session, let me just introduce uh, uh, our our first uh, expert panel speakers. Uh, the first one that will commence the uh, uh, program will be from architect Ar architect Haji Razin Mahmud, who is the principal of Razin Architects in Ramurhat, Malaysia. Okay. Now, uh, architect Haji Razin is someone who advocates the effort in bringing harmony to the environment in order to enrich life, particularly through the framework of sustainability. As a design endeavor and the architect as key facilitator, bringing together all elements concerned. Uh, with Razian Architects, uh, they have won numerous design awards, one that included the Abdul Latif Al Fozan Award for Mosque Architecture in 2019 and the Acacia Award for Architecture in 2014 for the same Musala, or, or we call it Surau in Malaysia. Uh, which is the Surau Nusa Idaman. Uh, of course, with works widely published in local media and as well as online international design news. So you may access uh, uh, the variety of works done by architect Razin or the Raz Razin Architects in Berhad uh, from the media within the website. Uh, architect Razin is also a committed practitioner to the academic course 
Now he is regularly being appointed as visiting tutor, external examiner and adjunct professor at UTM Skudai. Also a writer in the form of recently published book, Rethinking Tropical Islamic Architecture in Malaysia. Architect Haji Razin, are you ready for your session to begin? Uh, and if you are ready, I think uh, you can begin to share with us uh, your thoughts and, and, and your ideas. Uh, Oh, it's yours, Architect Razin. Thank you, Dr. Cairo. I'm going to share my slides now. Can everyone see it? I think it's it's working now. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I just realized that there's a time limit for this talk because I thought I was going to talk like for one hour. <laughs> okay. So, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I think this is an honor to, to be included in such a prestigious uh, session, an international webinar conference. And uh, I'm very excited uh, to be involved today. But before I start, let me uh, qualify myself. Uh, I hear a lot of uh, good words from Dr. Karu just now, saying that I'm an expert and all that. Uh, I may have to correct that. I'm still learning. I'm not an expert, uh, nor uh, am I a religious scholar. I'm not suggesting a definite solution. Uh, I'm merely sharing my experience throughout my journey in my practice. And uh, I'm hoping that through this kind of discourse, we could actually together think about uh, making uh, better and appropriate uh, architecture, especially uh, for the Muslims around the world. So my topic for today is rethinking tropical Islamic architecture. Okay, just a little bit about my company. Uh, we are in our 27th year this year. Uh, uh, we have a total of about 20 staff. So it's considered quite a medium-sized uh, company. And uh, I've been involved uh, mostly on the, uh, tropical design houses, uh, custom design uh, tropical houses, where like what Dr. Kairo said, I tried to bring in nature into buildings because uh, we strongly believe that architecture should be truthful to its time and place. So being in Malaysia, being in a tropical country, design should be made to conform to the climate and not merely for the sake of uh, showing uh, luxury or symbolism. Most of my projects that I've done, uh, Alhamdulillah, it is built and we managed to get the client to agree. Like this one right here, a showroom in uh, Bandar Dato On, where we plant trees inside the building, showing that luxury, green is luxury, it's not just about uh, designing enclosures with roof. We have even uh, tried to revive the uh, old vernacular style where we concentrate on providing roof uh, on an open space, like this tropical um, village house somewhere near Johor Bahru. But today is going to be solely on Islamic architecture. So, what is Islamic architecture? So there's this question that we ask ourselves, is it a building built by Muslim or is it building built by, for Muslim? Is it building built uh, with uh, Islamic principles? Or is it merely symbolism that shows that we are different than other faiths? So those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. So the stylism, I would say, if you learn from history, started uh, during the spread of the religion after the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, there were so many empires that spread out all the way to uh, East Europe and Spain. So each of them brought the style of wanting to be different from the existing faith that, that had built their empires before them. One of the most popular uh, symbol or image that we could uh, agree on is this 
mathematical geometric uh, patterns, which was perfected uh, by uh, uh, you know mathematics uh, scholars. Because Iman was already strong then, they were studying the moon, the stars, and the universe. At the same time, they were the one who uh, invented algebra and all these uh, trigonometries, sciences, and mathematical equations. So that is translated into patterns being placed on buildings, not only mosques, but also their private dwellings. This was the symbol of Islam then, not really a symbol, but it's more like a character because we were not allowed to put any figurines on our buildings, like what was done by uh, the classical movement. So we wanted to be different because we had different faith. We, want, we don't want to be the same as them. And our religion prohibited us from showing uh, figurines, whether... Uh, animals or human figures in our buildings. We invented uh, colors and patterns and so much. So it is even used until now. But the question we have to ask ourselves that are we stuck in time? Is it going to be forever with in the notion of having Islamic symbolism on our buildings? And this was like created, what, 800 years ago? And we're still using it until today. Can we find a way to relate to the current uh, uh, standing of our religion, of our faith? There are more people now, so there should be more patterns that could be created. You know, we shouldn't be stuck in time. We should show maybe a more progressive image of our religion. I mean, that's just talking about image. And then one of the best example was uh, from Andalusia, uh, Andalusia, Spain, during the, you know, the spread of Islam in that part of Spain. And this is the Grand Mosque of Cordoba. There's no domes. Uh, it was done in the vernacular Spanish style, the clay tiles and uh, the insertion of uh, different material in between the marble slab. And they had arches because at that point in time, that was probably the most uh, advanced manner to, to cover a, a big uh, space, a big hall. So that columns and arches everywhere. And this was indeed very special at that time because only the Muslim were doing this. And uh, it is different from the pointed uh, Gothic arch that was used by the Christians. And they also put uh, some uh, Quranic verses or holy words on the columns and some of the parts of the building. And this was Alhambra again. It was a jewel of uh, Granada. It was, you know, a symbol of uh, uh, success at one point in time. It was uh, decorated with Again, the geometric pattern. And there was also uh, water in the, in the premise because, believe it or not, uh, the Muslim at that particular time, and even today, had a formula in how paradise looked like. So they wanted to create paradise on earth. Inside, there's four rivers, uh, you know, meeting in the center, and there are greeneries in courtyards and all that. At the same time, they were trying to be truthful to uh, Islamic uh, teachings. Nothing is perfect except for Allah. So if you notice these columns in this courtyard, not all of them are double columns. Some of them are purposely done as single column because they don't want to show perfection. They wanted to show that this is man-made. Allah is perfect. Then there's insertion of gardens inside this building, not only because the translation of Quranic verses about paradise, but also it brings light and air into those big mansions. And there was Mukarnas, which is believed uh, to be developed from by mathematicians, 
as well as those who study the universe. And I would like to take uh, your attention to this mosque, the third largest mosque in the world after Masjid Haram and uh, Masjid Nabawi. Uh, I think it was in Casablanca. It's a single story mosque, huge mosque. Look at the scale. And uh, it is believed to, care to cater for over 100,000 worshippers at uh, peak hours during Friday prayers or during uh, Eid prayers, Idul Fitri or Idul Adha. Sad to say, even though this is new, but the style was taken from a mosque in Marrakesh. That was also built about 700 years ago. So again, uh, the question that came to mind that is this what Islamic architecture is, uh, is all about, where we actually bring back or we replicate the one that was built by, you know, those uh, builders during that time. And then we go to Turkey, the conqueror of uh, the Ottoman Empire who conquered uh, Constantinople, now called Istanbul. And the famous structure was this blue mosque with six minarets. Uh, we were told at that time, uh, Masjid al-Haram only had five minarets. So, but they wanted to build six for Istanbul. So they had to build the one in, in Mecca first before they actually went on to build this one in Istanbul. Very famous structure, very impressive. So much so, this is another one, this Masjid al Ayub, uh, also in Istanbul. I was so impressed with the symbol or the presence of the structure that we brought it back to Malaysia. This is Masjid Wilaya in Kuala Lumpur. So the question is that, uh, again, it's, it's stylism that is so important that we Applicate, no matter how odd it may look like in our climate or how expensive it might be. But uh, it is a symbol, so Islam means a grand symbol. So we built whatever that's built in Istanbul and we brought it here in Malaysia. And for the state of Johor, uh, we don't want to copy the Istanbul part, so we bring Andalusia to Johor. So this will build. Uh, in Andalusian style. I don't know what was the relevance between uh, the state of Johor and uh, Andalusia. Not only we bring the arches and the carvings, but also landscape. We plant uh, date palms, on kurma, here in Johor Bahru. But inside this uh, state parliament house or state parliament uh, meeting, as a gigantic sunlight, 55 degrees outside, and we try to keep it cool at 18 degrees inside. So I would like to, to show this example, uh, this simple example on where we tend to uh, make a mistake in understanding uh, symbolism versus function. This is camouflage. It's where our army, our soldiers dress to blend with nature as a safety feature that you know you hide from your enemy. So you must wear something that is uh, close to the surrounding. If it's in snow, they wear white. There's maybe shades of grey to blend with the grey trees behind them. And in desert, they wear this sand color, like light beige, so that they blend as well with the, uh, the background. It's a safety feature, so that they don't get easily noticed by their enemies, so that they don't get shot. In Malaysia, we use blue. I don't know what we're trying to hide from, but yes, maybe you are showing 
discipline, you are showing authority. But why does it have to be camouflage? Why can't you just wear a solid blue uniform and call it your uniform? And it doesn't it doesn't function as a safety feature anymore. It is merely about the symbol of having a regimented, very disciplined uh, group of people who has authority who can shoot you. Same thing we do with uh, architecture. We put domes, we put expensive marble, dress it up nicely. We boast about having the biggest carpet or the biggest carving whatsoever. Uh, no doubt it is beautiful, but uh, I personally tried to go there, wanting to experience praying in this room, but it was closed. Sadly, it was only open during Friday prayer. I had to pray in the smaller hall. So my conclusion to that is that we are in a race of building trophy mosques or trophy buildings as a symbol of progressive Islam. So is that acceptable? So I Google the most visited Islamic architecture. This is number one. Beautiful, no doubt. You know, with all the Quranic lettering on the walls and this rare gemstone that was brought in uh, all the way from, from South America, it was from Peru or somewhere, you know, all the way to India in order to complete this mosque. But it's not even a mosque. It's a tombstone, it's a mausoleum for two lovers. So they built a mosque on the left side Another one on the right side was just a, a replica of that mosque. The, the question is, is this what the, the religion is asking us to do? Where we glorify the dead and spend so much money on building this structure. We have been warned. The Holy Scriptures, the, the Quran says, the wasteful are brothers of the devils. Never has Satan been his Lord ungrateful. One example of a very modest approach in building mosques was this one in uh, Africa, where it's built with mud. That's the material that they have, easily uh, accessible, easily available for them. And uh, it's easily repairable as well. The biggest enemy was the rain. When it rains, the mud just fell off. It diluted and it just fell off from the structure. So what they do, they collect mud. They have a festival where they collect mud and repair the surface with the bare hands. The male uh, the guys yeah. climb up the building to repair the plaster. But the women gather foods and prepare big feast for them as well. So to me, this is a, a more appropriate of being truthful to his time and place, and to be truthful to his culture as well. So the word is sustainable, actually, where we build basic stuff, because like it or not, we have been uh, doing so much stuff that we actually create uh, uh, disturbance to our planet to trash all over the place, it polluted our river. And this has also been won in the Quran that environmental damage is done due to human actions. Corruption has appeared through land and sea by reason of what the hands of people have earned. So he may let them taste part of the consequence of what they have done and that perhaps they will turn to righteousness. And we were also asked to not do any mischief on earth. This is the order. This is the instruction from Allah Himself. 
what can we do as architects? My personal opinion is to go back to basics, where things were done at a much simpler pace. We build houses with material that we have around us. We cut the trees that we have in our backyard, send it to sawmill, cut it up to planks and columns and beams and erect our house with our bare hands. But this thing is so rare now that we can't afford to do this anymore because our tropical timber can fetch much better price in Europe and in America. We don't build like this anymore. Very, one of the very first mosques in Malaysia yeah. is this, Masjid Kampung Laut, Kelantan, the northeast part of Malaysia. Simple, no domes, no mirror even. Just basic vernacular architecture that's built to suit the climate. So I tried to do that. When I was asked to do a small prayer hall, I know this is like a dream for every mosque community. I have a mosque probably in green color with dome on top. But uh, I would like to mind that prayer can, can be done uh, everywhere as long as it is clean. But for us, we have to have a proper building to house this function. In some parts of the world, they can pray even on, on sidewalks because the mosque was not big enough for them. So when I got this project, they don't have much money. So I said, I can't build a proper building. So I just give you a prayer platform, the big roof on top, and probably one toilet. And then we put perimeter walls to prevent the animals from coming in, cats and dogs or whatever. What you have is one big shed. Maybe we put in some trees to reduce the driving rain. The wind is too strong. After that, I developed the plans to have a courtyard because we want to promote natural ventilation. This is the view of that prayer hall, the Musala, in Nusa Idamai. This is way back, this is done way back in 2010. Very simple material, just uh, steel structures, one big umbrella roof. We had no time to put windows even, we just put holes in the walls so that we can allow for air to circulate through this big uh, platform with one big umbrella roof. This is a look from outside. Uh, the overhang is three meters long. We make sure that we have uninterrupted airflow throughout the building. Because there was no infrastructure there, we also went for LED lights and solar panels. And we use whatever material that is donated to the uh, committee, like this color that was used as their wash basin. Alhamdulillah, we received uh, the highest award in the 2011 by uh, M, Pertubuan Malaysian Institute of Architects. Uh, the job was uh, published in China. And in 2013, we received uh, an award, 100 Architects of the Year from Korean Institute of Architects. And uh, in 2014, we, we received gold for sustainability. Uh, and it was listed. We did not win any award for this, Dr. Kairol. I have to uh, correct you. We were shortlisted among 24 uh, mosques in the world, uh, alongside with a few uh, famous mosques from Indonesia. I think Indonesia won the award for this. We went on to develop uh, a proper mosque because that one was uh, only a temporary surau, but it was used for more than five years. Then we built a proper mosque next to it. We were ambitious to build with a, a multi-purpose hall so that we can house 30,000 jamaah in, in, on Fridays or during I prayers. And then there was another one. Uh, where we built a mosque in a, in a village. Uh, I wanted to promote something uh, unique. Uh, it was just a square box because I say Kaaba was also a square, a cube. So I put a glass box in the center as their main prayer hall. 
at night when it's lit up, you could see the uh, silhouettes of the uh, calligraphy that we installed as shading device inside. But sad to say, uh, there was so much restrictions. We were not allowed to put any calligraphy, especially with uh, uh, holy words. And uh, we ended up building a simple one. And uh, the calligraphy was replaced with uh, timber patterns as a shading device. Also another one, this one is in Mandini Musala, a, a slightly different one, a big one. But we don't want it to function just only as prayer hall, but we want it to be, it to be a community center. So we went back to the history where the first mosque uh, that was built by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this uh, visual was actually taken from the book that was curated by architect Hazim, Hazim himself. So Haji Hazim, I'm using your visual here, uh, visual description of Prophet uh, Moss in Medina. It's an open space with open courtyard. At the back they have sofa because Moss also function as temporary shelter for those who uh, move from Mecca to Medina together with Prophet Muhammad. And it function as a uh, school where they learn about religion and all that. It was also a place for, uh, you know, training. It was a courthouse. It was everything that you need as a community center. And uh, in some other parts of the world, we could actually pray in open space like this. And uh, told them that uh, what you need is roof over their head because we can't pray on lawn because our lawns could be wet. So original intention was to build a big mosque, the blue box, educational facilities and community center, the pink one. I changed the diagram to this. The blue box is the mosque, yellow education facilities, pink is community center. And what I did was to insert a garden where you could also function as overspill praying area. So from this to this, and we also incorporate a full-fledged spot center next to the building. So this is a look of the uh, Madini Musola, Madini Mosque. You can actually pray uh, in the open space. No doubt the mosque is that glass box that you see at the front there. And we make sure there's at least 100 people that fit in there. And during Friday or during uh, special holidays, they can use the plaza as their overspill praying area. Another example, this is uh, somewhere near my neighborhood. We have a mosque that's only occupied on Friday. In most cases, there's only like, what, six, less than 10 people in the place, this is the mosque. And then we have a smaller prayer hall called the Surau. It serves uh, these uh, affordable homes, these uh, high-rise uh, affordable homes. And there was another smaller Surau. Uh, again, the maximum capacity is only like 15 of, uh, maximum uh, users only 15 to 20, where the capacity can actually fit 150 jama'ah. So when it comes to planning, we propose that all this be combined into one strategic location. What's the point of having three separate buildings when it's only occupied by, you know, a handful of people? So we propose a bigger site where we could you know, build a proper prayer hall. Then we built a multi-purpose hall that could also be converted as prayer hall on Fridays. Intention is to design something that is used throughout the week, not only on Fridays. We talk more about functions rather than symbolism. Okay, and of course we have a uh, uh, shading device all around the building to provide at least 50% shade 
the glass open glass area. Back to the uh, Masjid Nusaidaman, uh, the actual drawing that was presented to our client. This is built next to the surau that I first uh, showed just now. This is the early uh, renderings. We managed to get uh, full financing from one donor, which is very good actually. Then we work on the options on the facade treatment, where it's actually the shading device for the building. In the end, we went for simple uh, abstraction of nature. This is actually leaves. I call it the leaves. Leaves on trees. They are all the same, same shape, same size, but run in different direction. It's my attempt in trying to bring nature uh, into the building. <laughs> A metaphor, if you will. But at the same time, I also plant trees in between the screen and the actual hall, uh, the actual play hall. So my uh, questions to everyone, my question to everyone is that, uh, you know, what is Islamic architecture? I am posing this question uh, by showing you this stereotype, you know, standard decoration that we have in a Muslim home, maybe in Malaysia. We have the ayat, the verses of Quran, Allah and Muhammad side by side. So for those uh, modern couples, modern family, they don't go for traditional uh, lettering. They go for kufik, which is like more geometric, more abstract, uh, I suppose. But in Malay, we could actually translate that to uh, uh, language that we understand. This is Alhamdulillah, segala puji bagi Allah. Subhanallah, maha suci Allah. And this translation of uh, the Surah Al-Fatiha. This is the verses that you read uh, after sujud. And we use that as decoration rather than something that some of us do not even know how to read. So would that make us less Islam by using this uh, Roman lettering? But still trying to make sure that uh, the person or the visitor or even the owner of the house understand the meaning of those words. Even do it in English. So my attempt in architecture, it's something similar to that may not be replicating the stereotype symbol of minarets and domes and all the geometric patterns that was done 100 years ago. But I wanted to show a building that's unique to the users, that something that could actually encourage sense of belonging, something that will make the Congregation proud that their mosque is different. And at the same time, still make sure that it functions as a, a conducive or comfortable building to live in. This is the interior shot of the mosque. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Architect Razin, uh, for that, uh, uh, what they call, thoughtfully uh, provoking elements uh, to, 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 the, to the talk that you just presented. Uh, and uh, lots of questions actually um, uh, been, been thrown out, uh, thrown in into the, 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 the discourse of, of, of Islamic architecture through your presentation. Uh, and I'm sure that, that, uh, that uh, by leaving some typical questions uh, uh, with regards to, to the way that uh, you know uh, uh, we interpret architecture, Islamic architecture, in light of uh, uh, the current situation, the modern world, uh, perhaps would, would actually 
propel Islamic architecture forward. But but nevertheless, I think um, um, we would really among the audience might might want to ask some questions, uh, uh, some some critical questions, uh, and do do uh, do leave in your your comments and your questions uh, along the chat uh, chat box area. Uh, and uh, I, th I think uh, uh, architect Razin has actually uh, um, uh, begun uh, the, the 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 talk and ended it with with uh, with some uh, thought provoking uh, positions that we need to ponder uh, with regards to the future of architecture, Islamic architecture in particular, uh, in Malaysia and throughout the world, uh, uh, and and how do you actually uh, uh, take a kind of uh, uh, refreshment of of things uh, and, and and not being diverted. To, to to other things which are which do not actually matters most uh, at the at the current uh, uh, situation in time. Okay, great uh, um, sharing of thoughts, uh, uh, architect uh, Aj Ajirazin, uh, and I think this one uh, will leave some 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 uh, points to ponder amongst us. So we have to move on quickly uh, to the second speaker. All right. Um, before that, let me just introduce uh, uh, the speaker uh, in mind. Okay. Uh, the second speaker will be Dr. Urai Ferry Andi, which is the head of department, uh, Department of Architecture, Universitas Tanjung Pura, Pontianak, Indonesia. Uh, and Dr. Urai has received his PhD in architecture from ITB or Institute Technology Bandung. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Urai. In 2017, uh, and uh, Dr. Urai has since served as a lecturer in, in the University Universitas uh, Tanjung Pura. Uh, and his research areas, uh, re research, research areas of interest and expertise covers uh, uh, fundamentally on history and theory in architecture. Uh, and also typology and morphology in built environment. And he is also currently a member of the HTC, uh, uh, which is the History, Theory and Criticism uh, in Architecture and a research group within the university. So I think um, uh, basically uh, we have uh, um, uh, a rather rigorous and vigorous and fresh uh, uh, perspective from, from Dr. Urai, hopefully. But the uh, subject matter of interest uh, that you'll be give, giving a talk about will be uh, something entitled on the interpretation of Malay tradition on mosque architecture. All right. So Dr. Urai, if you are ready, the floor yes. is yours. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, Anwar, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. oh, yes, yes. Uh, let me present my presentation. Yes. Okay. Uh, you see my full presentation yes. okay uh, thank you uh, moderator uh, dr hairil anwar from UTM malaysia assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, first of all let me uh, introduce myself uh, my name is ure perindi and i'm a lecturer at the department of architecture at tanjung pura university uh, Pontianak. West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be able to make a presentation at this webinar together with the expertise from Malaysia and Pakistan too. Uh, I'm not a professional architect like uh, architect Razim. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry for that. So I'm not going to presenting my work. Uh, today, perhaps, uh, I want to deliver my presentation on the topic about reinterpret Malay's tradition on most architecture. Uh, you know, in uh, Malay words, most uh, uh, religious building was uh, very important for Malay people. Dr. Uh, Gray, before yeah? you continue, uh, can you please switch on to full mode presentation? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. So you can see. You still have to switch on the full mode. Okay. The full screen. Yeah. Is this full screen? 
Yes, yes, that's yeah. the one. Yes, yeah. Yes, that's all right. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, okay. So I want to present my uh, presentation about the interpret Malay tradition uh, on most detector. Uh, just give me a minute to manage my uh, screen first. I'm not quite familiar with this way back. I'm sorry. Okay, you see the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so the development of West Coast of West Kalimantan uh, was influenced by the spread of Islam originating from Malacca Peninsula. You know, uh, Malacca, the influence of Johor Sultanates to the Sambas Sultanates. Uh, and from Sumatra, from Palembang Sultanate, and the Middle East, from Hadramut and Yaman. Uh, the dakwah, trading, and political channel. You know that the Sultanate from Sultanate, they make a uh, reason, uh, they made a uh, uh, trading and extra. And the, the west coast of the Kalimantan found that some kingdom. Uh, Previously, can become a sultanate like a sultanate of Matan, Sukadana Sultanate, Kubu Sultanate, Pontianak Sultanate, Mempawah, and uh, Samba Sultanate. From the interior, uh, the spreading of Islam uh, influenced the Landa Sultanate, Tayam Sultanate, Masanggau, Skadau, and Sintang. We have uh, nine sultanates that attend, uh, nine to ten sultanates that. Uh, very uh, influenced from the Islam. Uh, is this a uh, full screen or not? Uh, no, you have actually oh. reverted to the old format. Oh. So you'd have to actually have a full screen. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe I have to minute. Excuse me, I want to make to screen first. You can press the full screen down at the bottom right hand side. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible? Okay. You can see that. Yes. Full yes. Screen? Yes. Full screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I repeat my presentation. Uh, so I began with the spread of Islam in West Kalimantan. Uh, the development of the West Coast Kalimantan was greatly influenced by the spread of Islam uh, originating from Malacca Peninsula. In this case, uh, we see that uh, Sultanate Johor to Sambas from Sumatra or Palembang and the Middle East or uh, Hadramut. Yeah. Yaman about 15 centuries to the dakwah, trading and political channel from Sultanate to Sultanate. We can see the the spread of the Islam from the coast of uh, Western Kalimantan, you know the uh, via uh, water, sea and river. Many kingdom in the coast turn to Sultanate, uh, an Islamic uh, government. Among other, uh, the uh, Matan Sultanates, Kubu Sultanates, Pontiana, and Mempawah and Sambas. One of the legacy of the spirit of Islam is uh, Sultanate Palace and Sultanate Mosque. Sultanate Mosque, uh, in this case, have certain characteristics that represent the Sultanate itself. Local community, local contact, and distance them from mosque in other places. Perhaps we can see the difference from the mosque in Middle East or in uh, other country from the mosque in Malay world. 
apa uh, in line with the development and the rise and the fall of Sultanate Palace, uh, Sultanate Mos tend to be able to survive both physically and in function. The characters uh, perhaps must be uh, we maintain to strengthen the character of the mosque and community building in the future so that it's not it's not easily eroded by the changing of times. The current mosque, you know, the tend to be uh, prioritized grandeur, modern, and forget the value of the surrounding community. On the presentation uh, Aztec Tazim, we see that uh, almost the mosque now has the dome set yeah, in modern uh, architecture uh, with the high material like marble and other. Now, uh, this is the Malay Sultanate Mosque in West Kalimantan. Uh, we have uh, nine mosques that is, was, bought, was built uh, since the, uh, the Sultanates. First, uh, there are Bintang Mosque, it is uh, in Tang in the interior, it's about 1972. Uh, then Tayan Mosque, 1883. Sambas Mosque is 1702. Andak Mosque is about 19, uh, 90, uh, 1895. Uh, then Pontianak, 1771. And Mempawah, Sanggau, and Matan Mos, and Sekado Mos. This is a traditional Mos uh, uh, built, built uh, the Sultanate. Uh, the establishment of this mosque, first, first I want to describe the Malay Sultanate Mosque, which is Sintang Sultanate Mosque. This mosque is established uh, by the Pangeran Tunggal, yeah, after taking the throne of replace Prince Agung in 17th uh, century, uh, in the form of simple mosque with capacity of around 50 people so the early mosque is not quite big just a small uh, mosque that capacity is around 50. The mosque was later renovated by Sultan Nata in 1972. Sultan Nata is the king who used the title Sultan for the first time of, in the history of Sintang Sultan. This is the location of the uh, mosque. Uh, this is the Yes, yeah, palace, palace. This is the palace from, and this is the mosque, and this is the colonial administration, call it controller or uh, residence. Location of the Sultanate Mosque was near to the palace that became right or left of the palace according to cardinal direction. But we see that uh, mosque is orientation to the river. This is the Sintang Sultanate Mosque, the traditional mosque, was built by the Sintang Sultanates. As we can see, the mosque was made all by the wood material. The mosque will consist of three uh, pyramid troop uh, structure, a troop covering by uh, wood. We call it sirap, atap sirap. There are two minarets in the front of the left and the right of the mosque. On the most there is an open hallway, open hallway before entering the uh, mosque. We call it uh, Serambi in Bahasa. Inside of the mosque is a large room, a large open space with supporting structure consists of nine main pillars of them from the wood. Uh, so this is the praying room. Second mosque is Sambal Sultanate, Sambas Sultanate Mosque. This mosque was built by Sultan Umar Akomodin, who ruled the Sultanate Sambas in 1902 until 1927. 
This small mosque was later renovated by his son, Sultan Muhammad Safiuddin, and developed into a Jami Mosque on October 10. The function of the mosque at that time was to take care of legal issue, marriage registration, divorce, reconciliation, and as a collection agency for Jakarta Pitra. And uh, a mistake in this. So that the mosque is not uh, just for praying room, but there's uh so function is uh, as uh legal issue take care of legal issue made at registration and etc is the location of the small the most uh the near to palace yeah the river bank the mosque itself uh, consists of two floor with three petals roof on the side facing the river, there are two minarets. The minarets, two minarets uh, on the left and, and the right. Some of the rooftop, there are decoration in the form of stupa. Now, there is uh, some uh, decoration or, or symbol in the back of the roof, like a uh, stupa set. Yeah? Uh, perhaps. Uh, this is influenced from the Hindu period. This is the, the mosque itself from different view. This is the interior. The inside of the mosque consists of two rooms, namely the left and right for uh, the closed mosque. The middle part is the main room supported by the main structure in the form of wooden uh, pillars. The top uh, of the floor uh, is only on the, the side, the, the edge, while the middle is a point open to the uh, lower floor. The top mosque is Pontianak Sultanate Mosque. It is built along the establishment of the Pontianak Sultanates in 1971. Uh, this mosque is originally a simple mosque, or we call surau. surau. Uh, then, during the leadership of Sultan Sarip Usman, uh, this was later built. It's the location of the mosque, right, uh, the the except This is the, the old picture of the mosque. We, we can see that the roof is uh, consists of three layers, and the uh, top of the uh, roof is a uh, form like a cells or stupa too, in Hindu period. This is the different side of the mosque. Is the interior of the mosque. So uh, the mosque consists of uh, nine uh, main pillars. Uh, you can see that the windows and doors are consist of uh, couple places. Then this is the Sultanate Mosque. It's built in 1926. Mosque is uh, the mosque also has a royal plaque pool at the Surya Negara Palace. The Sultanate Mosque has undergone renovation. The last is in July 26, 9, uh, 2009. This is the location of the mosque. This is the old picture of the mosque. This is the current of the mosque. Oh, this uh, we can see uh, this. There is also some decoration or and like stupa in the top of the roof. This is the Skadau Sultanate Mosque. It built during the Sultan Anum in 1930 to 1961, located next to the palace and overlook the Skadau River. We can see too the top of the uh, roof, they are from like bell and stupa too. Uh, and the uh, I just uh, rope. 
Then there is Tayan Sultan Mosque, uh, Sultan Mosque, yeah. built in conjunction with the movement of the center of Tayan Sultanates from Rayang to Desa Pendalaman in 1983. This is the location. This is the mosque. This mosque is quite uh, innovation. Yes. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, some additional uh, form in the of the rope. This is the Tayan Sultanate Mosque. And this is the Landa Sultanate Mosque uh, during, uh, was built during the Panembahan, Gusti Abdul Ajis, Kusuma Akamudin. And then was in 2000, it was uh, demolished and new mosque built in the same location. It's very pity that the mosque is no longer exists. And then we have uh, Mempawah Sultanate Mosque in 1909 uh, by Panembahan Mempawah. Uh, location is the bank of the Mempawah River, not far from the palace of Sultanat. You see, this, there is a different shape of the rope. Uh, it's hexagonal. Uh, uh, this is the mosque of the Sultanate, Mempawah Sultanates. And the last is Matan Sultanates, uh, originally located on the edge of Pawan River, Kauman Village. However, due the abrasion, was moved to another location in 1950 and changed its name to Masjid at -Takwa. The Jami Mosque from the Sultanate Matan now lives only a pole which remains preserved. This is no uh, only a, a pole that they remain preserved with the new mosque. So uh, then I want to uh, interpret the Malay tradition of all those mosques. In this section, I want to compare first the Japanese mosque and Malay mosque. First, about the shape of the mosque. In Japan mosque, uh, we see that uh, the shape is simple and square plan. So uh, it's same to the Malay mosque. It's simple and square plan too. All of mosques in West Kalimantan have the simple and square plan. Then uh, about the foundation. In Japan mosque, uh, all mosques uh, of the mosque standing on solid foundation and rather height. But in West Kalimantan, uh, standing on wood piles and not quite high, uh, except the uh, Sanggau, Sanggau Moss. Uh, uh, quite high uh, on the wood uh, pile. The in number three, overlapping uh, limas or pyramid rope that get smaller on the higher. It's about the rope on the Japa Mosque. In Malay Mosque, there are overlapping limas or pyramid roof that get smaller and high. Again, uh, sample Sintang, Landa, Sanggau, dan Tayan. But there are two overlapping limas roof with a crown, uh, stupa, a bell on it, and sambas, pontiana, and skadau. Then there are overlapping roof with hexagon shaped peak, like Mempawah Mosque. We see that. The next point, we talk about mihrab on the west or northwest side. I think mihrab is uh, almost the same, uh, located at the on the on the west northwest side, because it uh, describes the kiblat, right? And uh, next point about the teras. In Japan, most terrace on the front, left, right, either closed or open. Uh, in some Malay mosques, there are terrace on the front, left, right, uh, either closed or open. But there are mosques with without terrace. That is, uh, Mpawa Mosque, uh, Landa, Mpawa, dan uh, Landa Mosque. The, about the courtyard, in the mosque, in Java Mosque, is surrounded by a wall and there is an entrance gate. But in the Malay mosque, uh, was not surrounded by a mosque. It's all open. 
That's uh, different between Japamos and Malemos. About the location, all the Japamos located west of the plaza uh, from the palace or the plaza in the front of the palace. But in the Malemos, it's not always on the west of the plaza. There are uh, located on the west of the plaza. But some of the mosques also located northwest, located on the north, south, southwest, and southeast. Okay. And uh, about the Maksura. Maksura is a place for the king or sultan or pray, prayer and the connecting path. So there is a connecting path from the palace to the mosque in Japa Mosque. In the Malay Mosque, there are there is no maksura or kinetic pet. All of the mosque is open to public, and the sultan is uh, to uh, go outside first and then go to the mosque. There are no uh, connecting pet uh, between the palaces and, and the palace and the mosque. Then the next point, there is a grape complex behind or next to the mosque. Uh, in Malay Mosque, there are also a grapes complex behind or next to the mosque. About the structure of the of the building, the Japa Mosque uh, uh, generally called as Sakaguru, with number of four, six, eight, or even one. But in the Malay Mosque, uh, they are very uh the form of four main pillar six main pillar until nine main pillar until 12 main pillars this is the the different the comparison between japan mosque and malay mosque the important point is in this compare is the location and the orientation of the mosque uh as orientation, see, we know that uh, in the layout of Japanese palace, most are arranged and placed in the framework of Japanese philosophy, such as as uh, mancapat, mancalima, for the purpose of filling the power of the king and the kingdom. Uh, mancapet, mancapat, uh, mancalima uh, describe the pattern of settlement uh, development starting. Uh, from one main village, it is surrounded by four sub pillars located in the four direction of the uh, eighth section. Uh, it's regulated the layout of the building around the palace, including the mosque. But in the layout of Malay Sultanate Palace, the position of mosque does not have a certain orientation and hierarchy. It is a different between uh, Malay and Japan mosque in the orientation. In this picture, we can see that uh, uh, almost Japa mosque it uh, located in the in the uh, west of the uh, palace it is the plaza. It is the framework of Manchapat Manchalima. Generally, in the Malay mosque. Uh, most are located after the palace in the direction of river flow from the downstream to upstream. So there is a influence of the uh, river downstream and upstream. Setting up the most, uh, including the palace complex, uh, form pragmatically do the pattern of development of the Sultanate Palace area along the river side, which involve accessibility and threats activity. In this picture, you can uh, see uh, the location and the orientation of the mosque of the Malay Sultanates. Uh, generally, uh, the mosque located at the bank of the river and oriented to the river. This is the Malay Sultanate, eh, Ketapang Sultanate, Sintang Sultanate, uh, Landa, Sambas, Sanggau, Sekadau, Tayan, Bawah, dan Pontianak. The river uh, itself is important for 
transportation and communication. Uh, so the life of the so do the life of the Malay community is also very dependent on the existence of the river. The position of the mosque does not have to be in the west of the palace, as in Japas Mosque. Uh, in the Malay Sultanate, the location of the mosque can be on the west, east, south, south east, uh, east of the palace. That's the the different of the orientation from the Japas Mosque. Then we talk about symbol and ornament. Before uh, Islam arrived, uh, all the Sultanate is the uh, two kingdom. Uh, the kingdom there to the Hindu Buddha beliefs. So that symbol during the Hindu Buddha era was still uh, reference to the mosque. Uh, as we can see in this picture that uh, on the top of the rope of some mosque using decoration in the form of stupa, clappers or bells, which are usually found in the temple building or Hindu Buddhist religious, uh, religious uh, building. So the previous tradition that is still used, still used even uh, it has changed to Islam. That's uh, how uh, we 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 uh, read the re interprets the tradition, uh, Malay tradition to Islam. Uh, then uh, some or actually of the Sultanate mosques were built during the Dutch colonial rule, so that the influence of uh, European architecture more or less appear in the building. For example, we see the window with the colorful glasses, uh, cube shapes on petalation like uh, you know uh, Italian or Art Deco. Then we have mihrab. Uh, mihrab is an uh, important element in the mosque. Malay Sultanate must have mihrab with various shapes and ornament. Uh, this is according to the character of the Sultanate shape. The symbol uh, present the identity of the Sultanate. The color of uh, gold, uh, yellow, and green became the color of the greatness of the Sultanate. Then, uh, where does the most preference come from? See that uh, there's a uh, reference, and what we see right now is the current reference, and let's uh, let us uh, pre preference about the uh, most architecture. Uh, the architecture form of Japanese most as they are derived, derived from the form of local community building. Uh, example, Wantilan in Bali or Japanese pen, Pendopo. So uh, some of the most, the, the uh, early most in Java, uh, it's derived uh, from the form of the uh, local community building, like uh, Balai or some Pendopo. Not just, uh, not a new building that uh, built for the mosque. Referring to the, the Malay Sultanate Mosque, which is quite different from the palaces and other local buildings, it, we can see that uh, palace and the mosque in Malay uh, Sultanate Mosque in Kalimantan quite different. It should be assumed that the architectural form, uh, the architectural form of the Malay Sultanate Mosque was influenced by outside. Uh, by outside top and knowledge, namely ulama who broke Islam to the sultans. Uh, as we as I mentioned before, from Palembang, Java, Bugis, and Middle East, ulama is uh, who bring and teach Islamic teaching have important role in mosque architecture. For example, the architectural form of the mosque with stupa on the top of the roof can also seen in the mosque in Palembang. This is uh, in Palembang, uh, the earlier mosque in uh, before the mosque in Kalimantan. Uh, so that 
some of the form in Palembang moss are currently used in moss in uh, Kalimantan too. In addition, uh, scholar from Middle East and Johor, several uh, ulama from Java, uh, like uh, Dema, uh, then ulama from Bugis, also spread region in Kalimantan. Several from Abmos has similarity with in Java, like this the Makmos and Agung Mos. The form of three triangle rope tapering upward. While the octagonal uh, rope of the Mempawah Mos has similarity with the octagonal rope in Ternatin and Tidore. Now, in the modern reference, currently uh, the most architecture and even uh, Islamic architecture refer to most in the Middle East, which are considered as the center of the early Islam. The architectural form of the most today use a dome roof with large and pulp pillars, concrete and marble material. Uh, some people uh, perhaps say it uh, dome is uh, identically to the mosque. Say if there's no dome, then that is no mosque. Or otherwise, if the building has a dome, then that was a mosque. Even though some uh, church has a dome too, that's quite uh, I think uh, confusing too. We all know that the shape of the dome has been known since Byzantine uh, period uh, in church building at the time. So the considering uh, related to climate condition, geography, and tradition of culture in most, this sign are progressively being abandoned. The identity of a uh, mosque is determined by the shape of the bomb and the copular. In let's uh, preference, uh, let's development, contemporary mosques appear with a dynamic architectural style and philosophy. The architecture of the mosque is no longer uh, understood as the shape of the dome and copilar, but rather the philosophical concept offer. The philosophical concept offer tend to be abstract, referring to the concept of Islam as a religion and a way of life. Uh, that the architect said. However, the, the philosophy concept that are carried out uh, are generally least understandable, uh, understandable by the public. In rice question, that's only architect can answer. Some of the most architecture right now starting to put the essence of Islamic teaching as the basis of the design. For example, this is the uh, for example, uh, uh, philosophy uh, in the name of Abla, Asmaul Husna, like the mosque in uh, Parahyangan, Bandung. This is the folded uh, architecture. Uh, this is the mosque in rest area 88 in Padalarang, Bandung. So they, they uh, focus on the philosophical concept of the Islam. So the conclusion is, uh, the architecture of the Sultanate Mosque in Java and Malay differ in terms of geographical condition, natural resource, and Islamic concept that were believed. The form of the architecture of Mosque is strongly influenced by external factor, ulama or Sultanate preference and acculturation of various symbols like religion, belief, and politics. In Malay tradition, the Sultan does not become God's representative of earth. Sultan is a caliph who has a position similar to the ulama. The Malay Sultanate Mosque as religious institutions are independent. Sultanate Mosque remain exist even the Sultanate or the, its palace has been lost of or ended. So some, uh, Sultanate has no power right now, but the mosque is still remain still. The architectural design preference preference of mosque changes according to the development 
a perspective of the architect and society. In the early day, local tradition and condition become a reference in the initial design of the mosque. Then, along with the development of information and technology, most design refer to the formation of mosques in other places, especially Islamic countries. This in the style and perspective of architect, like a postmodern style, related to the essence of the philosophy of architecture, produce dynamic and abstract mosque architecture. So that. My conclusion for this presentation, I hope uh, uh, we all can uh, understand how the Malay tradition to uh, reinterpret to the most architecture and for the contemporary or, or latest uh, preference in most are being uh, not uh, quite uh, considered Malay tradition anymore. I think that is uh, I can deliver uh, pro, uh, pro my presentation, Dr. Anwar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Urai. Uh, a very interesting uh, juxtaposition between between two ethnic uh, development of mosques uh, uh, based along lines of the Javanese and the Malay. And uh, it's, it's, it's the first time I've seen it <laughs> because uh, I think uh, uh, basically uh, there is always uh, this understanding that the Javanese and the Malay are basically ah. from satu rumpun, from the one rumpun, you know. Uh, but but yeah, uh, yeah. what you have done is basically to actually uh, use the juxtaposition, the differentiation to actually come up with a, a definition, yeah. you know, a, a, a way to define, you know, the differences. Okay, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, a lot of uh, uh, conclusion can be made uh, from your presentation. Okay, we have uh, actually culminated the second, uh, completed the second uh, presentation. So therefore, it's time for a, a proper Q&A session, but only for 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, but uh, we, we have had uh, earlier questions. Right. So I, I think we do have to give priority to, to the, the, the pro, uh, questions provided earlier. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you agree, uh, if, you, if you all agree to that. So I will throw in uh, a set of questions uh, for both yourself, uh, sorry, uh, to Akitak Haji Razin and also to Dr. Urai. Okay, here goes the question specifically for architect uh, uh, Haji Razin. Uh, what is your perception for future mosque design development in Malaysia? Uh, and the concept of wastefulness in designing mosques, as many of mosques design much focuses on beauty of aesthetic, aesthetics that defy value of humility propagated by the prophet. Okay. Uh, the second question uh, uh, would be how would masjid play the role as community center or societal epicenter in current gig economy and its impact on masjid architectural topology? Right. So, so uh, uh, and the third question. Uh, uh, the, the reason why I'm, I'm actually throwing the, the full set of questions is actually hopefully it can be summed up uh, beautifully by, by both yourself, Architect Ajirazin, and also uh, Dr. Urai. Uh, and the third question reads like this, uh, sometimes symbolism plays important role in defining function. As a designer, how far symbolism can be used as a design principle in Islamic architecture? It is important not to be randomly reinterpreting specific building topology until the building lost its identity. And the final question actually specifically goes to Dr. Urai. Uh, what are the lessons learned from this traditional mosque in Kalimantan to design contemporary mosques in Kal Kalimantan for the 21st century, bearing in mind that we have the new capital city of Indonesia, Nusantara, in Kalimantan? Okay, so so I think uh, these are the four set of questions which can be read from, from, from the list uh, uh, provided uh, in the chat box. So perhaps, uh, Architect Razin, if you can can quickly sum up at least three questions that are relevant to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, yeah. I can see that the questions come from uh, Britpo, uh, Kira Rahmat, uh, Architect Hazwan, uh, and uh, Isma Lina over there. Uh, yeah, like what I said in my uh, first statement, uh, I don't have all the answers. But I try as much as possible to answer this question. How will masjid play a role as community center? The thing is, uh, from, from the early days during Prophet Muhammad, please be upon him, 
it has always been a community center. Masjid is not only for uh, solat. It's not only for five prayers. Uh, somehow or other, during uh, the modernization of our society, somehow we tend to separate faith and uh, our daily lives. Whereas Islam is actually a uh, lifestyle. It's part of life. So it would be nice to see actually uh, a masjid being used as a full-fledged community center, uh, and I'm testing myself here, regardless of faith. What's wrong with having people of different faith coming to our mosque? After all, isn't that what we are supposed to do? To share our faith by showing them what we do? When we decided to have domes and all this popular symbolism on our building, sometimes it tends to actually uh, deter them from me. Oh, that is already a sacred building, a holy building, house of God, so we shouldn't get close to that building. But it will be nice to actually uh, spread the words or spread the da'wah by allowing them to come and see us up close and personal. You know, of course, they have to abide by certain guidelines, meaning they have to dress up decently. Uh, they have to probably respect the prayer times during which they have to be quiet and all that. But there's nothing wrong with having uh, community activities together. Uh, in the Masjid Nusra Daman that was completed in 2019, uh, they actually hosted a grand uh, local fruit festival. Everybody can only come in and eat their fruits. Free of charge. We even uh, wanted to promote uh, commercial activity by having cafeterias, uh, like a small fashion outlet. But some or other, it is it's closed down now because there's a strict requirement where you cannot allow commercial activities in mosques. So something's wrong there. What's wrong with having, you know, a commercial activity in the mosque compound? But uh, these are the things that needs. Uh, further discourse, further discussion among the building expert, uh, sociologists maybe, and even the people uh, in, in religious body who actually come up with all guidelines in, in most building. That's number one. And that's the first question. Secondly is the symboliz symbolism. Yes. Of course, uh, it plays any bother. We want to know when we go to a place, oh, that is a mosque. So it gives us this, this confidence that we went to the right building. But the uh, problem is, does it have to be a physical appearance? Uh, does it have to be the, the external look of the building? And the function actually defines the identity. Like I said, if you talk, if you're looking at symbolism of a great faith with many followers, do you think being in a beautiful building uh, would be better than those who pray in the open corridors of open plaza in places like Russia and China? So we need to address that properly. Japanese don't build don't enlarge their Shinto temple in their public buildings to show that they are Japanese. Somehow or other, they get the, the spirit of, of being uh, minimalist, the, the Zen spirit, they translate that into a building character. And uh, no matter how big the building is, we still call it Japanese without seeing the typical Shinto temple roof on their building. So I think we have a long way to go where we need to do more uh, experiments, I would say, that get this thing acceptable. But maybe a uh, play hall is probably a, a, probably a function of that building. But like I said, we have to have a building that is used throughout the day, throughout the week, and not just during prayer times. I have to say that some of our mosques are so big that you can't even have one staff 
during Zoho prayer? Because it's just so big. Can it be designed to suit the everyday use comfortably and at the same time allow for expansion or overspill when the crowd gets so too big? So uh, that is my answer to those. Thank you, Dr. Cairo. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Razin. Uh, also, in a follow up to another question uh, for Dr. Urai, would you like to actually uh, clarify on that, Dr. Urai? Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, yeah, answer the first question about the MOS as a community center. Uh, the MOS as a community center has been Actually, it's been carried out by the Sambas Mosque in Kalimantan, which is a place for education, marriage, divorce, and other social uh, problem or issue. Uh, in Malay Sultanates, there is a position of wazir, which, it, which is generally by uh, ulama, who then play a role in the mosque as the center of the community activities. So I think uh, in tradition, in Mali tradition, uh, a mosque is not only as a praying room. It's always as a place to educate it uh, for the social uh, problem or social issue and other uh, solution uh, for the community. I think that uh, uh, tradition or that uh, function, we can... Uh, 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 use again in the mosque right now. And that's it for the, the community center, the mosque as community center. And the next question about uh, the most always associate with royal family or noble person. Okay. Thank you for the question. From my research, uh, the mosque is not always uh, a privilege uh, for the palaces or nobility. Uh, but because uh, the ulama are most involved in the mosque, uh, in the mosque there should be no social classes. Hadis, uh, we know that uh, it states that the level of human before Allah is the same expert for the level of the faith. So in the uh, Malay uh, mosque initially, uh, in the Japa mosque, uh, in early days, is initially a special place for king and noble, but in the Malay mosque, there was no such difference. So we can see that in the early mosque, uh, Japa mosque, there is a place called Sarah, uh, uh, connecting path from the palaces to the mosque, and the king or the sultan has a special space in the mosque. But in Malay, the from my uh, research, there are no such place like Muksara. So the Sultanate has the same uh, level, same space uh, to the other uh, people or community. I think that's uh, my answer. That's my uh, opinion about the question. Thank you, Dr. Hairil Anwar. Okay, thank you very much, uh, both of you, Akita Haji Razin and also Dr. Urai. We are actually very uh, running uh, way behind in terms of time. Uh, and I think uh, the, the questions are, uh, have kept coming, have, kept, have been kept keeping, uh, uh, have been keep on going. So uh, uh, you, you'd have uh, many, uh, many, uh, many questions remain unanswered. So uh, my suggestion to both Akita Haji Razin and Dr. Urai, as we move on to the third and fourth uh, 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 sessions, uh, if you may, you can actually answer on the spot okay, within the okay. chat box. So, so I think I think there are at least four questions uh, that we are we are having while we are in the session of Q and A, right? So, okay, thank okay. you very much to both of you. Uh, a, a very a very interesting and enlightening uh, way of uh, uh, discussing about this this uh, this this these two subject matters uh, areas. Uh, but uh, I find I find it very interesting in that sense. Uh, and but we have to. Uh, move quickly, quickly to the third session and the fourth session, right? Uh, in order to 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 actually be fair on the time. All right. Uh, let me just quickly move on uh, to the uh, the uh, third session, uh, which is um, the third speaker that we are referring to uh, is actually 
architect Haji Azim uh, Aziz Abdul Aziz ya yeah? uh, the principal Atsa Architects in Denver Hat uh, Malaysia alright okay um, uh, architect Azim uh, is a founding member of the Atsa Architects uh, in 1992 uh, and you can imagine that within the span of 30 years of experience of, of a medium sized uh, firm uh the firm also has been garnering multiple award winning uh schemes uh which which uh, having look at through the the website and uh, through the uh the 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 the, fl the flip book uh, which uh, shows and describes uh the the multitude of work done by Sa architects i think uh, would not be sufficient to 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 actually uh, put them on the list uh, within this this uh, introduction but uh, uh it's easy to say that the fact that uh, uh, architect Azim with us architects has won many awards uh, from the likes of PAM uh, and also the uh, uh, MID and also the International Design Award that has been granted for, for the various buildings that have been designed and completed under us architects. Uh, and us architects is also uh, listed as top 10 architecture practice in Malaysia by BCI Asia. And in addition, uh, architect Azim is also a publisher of a book recently uh, produced a masjid or selected mosque from Islamic world. Uh, and maybe we probably would like to share it later uh, in a different session for, for, for a discourse on this particular book that, that has been uh, uh, published by architect Haji Azim. Yeah? Okay, without further ado, uh, can we invite uh, architect Haji Azim uh, to, to share with us uh, the experience uh, and the thoughts uh, all yours, uh, Architect Ajazim. Uh, so, uh, Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, Carol. Uh, thank uh, you for inviting me, for giving this uh, talk. I try to be as brief. I know uh, we are running, running late and it's going to be a quick uh, presentation just to see some images and the work that we have done. Actually, we are, um, I did not start uh, doing more architecture, but eventually since uh, we did uh, uh, Moss along the way, and then we did one of the first sustainable moss uh, back in 2015. Then and I published some books. Then we become more in, in more into moss, and uh, people are regarded as as a as a uh, moss architect uh, architect uh, designing moss. I like to share some of my uh, uh, work in moss architecture. And and I would like to just uh, because there's a uh, few slides, so what I need to do is to move fast, just in the interest of time, so that we won't be too late. I try to manage it within the next twenty five minutes, if possible. Uh, okay, can I? I like to share my slides. Can in, can anyone see my slides? Yes. Can see? yes. Okay. I'll I'll go to the next slide. Yeah. That's no. uh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, go through uh, the moss psychology, uh, both uh, locally and internationally. I'd like to start with international moss. This has been, uh, I think, uh, been uh, written and been uh, even uh, uh, spoken about for a long time. And uh, as you know, uh, moss architecture has started uh, a very long time. And, as um, as early as when Islam has been into the scene, uh, different countries have a different approach in mosque architecture, uh, and, and we have uh, 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 from uh, the earlier days, uh, Arabian mosque, Umayyad, Timurid, and all the way to the modern time. I stopped by uh, with this is the Masjid Negara. Masjid Negara is a Malaysian uh, national mosque. And it was built in 1965. It is categorized as the uh, as the. Uh, Sorry yeah. for this, architect. I think your slides are not moving. Okay. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Uh, okay, the, I, I stopped in 1965. Oh, not moving. 
Yeah, it's uh, uh in this um uh, I stopped at uh, Masjid Nagara because it's actually built in 1965 and it's actually the uh, post-Medeka architecture. It lasted till about 1980s as a, as a modern uh, approach into architecture. Not only um, Islamic architecture, but building architecture. Since after that, in, in the 80s, uh, in, in mosque architecture, especially is a period of Islamic, Islamination, uh, which means that the uh, architecture of most uh, of the Islamic or the mosque architecture has changed to incorporate uh, various design that is brought in from other um, countries, like other Islamic countries, uh, that has changed and has happened for the last thirty years. So right now, uh, as I, I see it, um, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a crossroad. Whether we're going to repeat the last thirty years, or we're going to uh, uh, progress into a different direction, uh, there are eight uh, eight typologies of local architecture. Uh, most of it is influenced by uh, the traditional vernacular, which actually brought in, you know, during um, in from Sumatra uh, architecture, which is actually uh, was previously known to be the you um, know a combination of Hinduism, Buddhism and uh, later a conversion to is Islam. So the typology is pretty much tropical and vernacular. Then the, uh, after that, the Sino-Eclectic European and uh, North Indian are actually uh, brought in from other countries uh, because of the influence of the colonization period between the Portuguese, Dutch, uh, the British. They have influenced the architecture. And uh, the modernistic uh, number six, uh, modernistic um, architecture uh, is where the uh, post mudeka uh, where, where we wanted to uh, break up from the traditional coloni colonization architecture. So we do want to do something that we, we are uh, different from being uh, ref uh, reflecting or being copied from the colonization era. So then, uh, uh, after that, in the 80s, uh, the postmodern revivalism, revivalism, where uh, we go back to architecture that has been done overseas and, and uh, using elements from uh, the uh, Islamic world, or other than in, in, in uh, this part of the region, uh, into uh, the scene. And lastly, which is more recent, uh, I, I take it as uh, to mid middle of... Um, well, 2015 uh, onwards, when architecture has changed to more progressive architecture, into more uh, um, progressive Islamic architecture. So, just to go this uh, quickly, um, let's say I, I was uh, struggling in terms of how to define Islamic architecture, and uh, uh, there was an exhibition sometime in the early 2000 where where the uh, uh, exhibition is all about. Uh, Islamic architecture, and, and uh, I take it from there. And since I I don't want to uh, reinvent uh, what are the principles, so there are seven principles: uh, yeah, tahwid, uh, ikram, uh, ikhlas, and um, ilmu, uh, itisad, uh, aya, and uh, zikir. So uh, the way I see it is, not every of these um, principles can be put into one building. You can just take one or two and you know use it and uh, and more explore it more deeply uh, into your building. If you want to define uh, Islamic architecture. Uh, so going back um, to vernacular architecture, as uh, uh, Razin and also uh, the previous speaker was, talk was talking about, you know this is what uh, Islamic architecture was about in the past. Yeah, it just so uh, this is what it was, and uh, it, it is still uh, being used now. This uh, pyramidal roof, and, and it's modernized. Uh, this is one of the masjid that we are using at Eco Majestic that we are building right now, and uh, it's like a modernization of what we saw as vernacular architecture. But we use more of the modern materials, steel, uh, bare bricks, um, even uh, metal roofing. Uh, is the simplest form, and it's very tropical and uh, so very suitable uh, for uh, our hot and humid climate. 
and you can see that it's very light uh, and uh, light can enter and well ventilated. So uh, uh, it's also um, quite, uh, not to say cheap as in cheaply built, but cheap as in uh, monetary yeah, to build so that it won't be too expensive. And um, we, uh, we don't have to use too much of the ornaments and it's very restrained in, in providing that sort of ornaments, which can be very expensive. And this is also uh, located mainly in uh, uh, some uh, housing development and it can fit about maybe 500 to 1,000 people. And, and all housing development and here in Malaysia are required to have um, uh, a surau. And a surau is like a musala and there's a small, it's not, it's not really for uh, um, uh, Friday prayers, but for the five uh, and also activities, community-based activities to be uh, used. So this is another version. Now uh, we try to play around um, uh, with the uh, forms to allow for ventilation and uh, adding water as a cooling agent and uh, providing multi-purpose hall, which is uh, normally used for what we call it tandoori here, or, uh, or uh, weddings uh, for uh, for uh, the brides and grooms who uh, who like to get married near the mosque and use this as a as a place as well as some sporting events. So uh, again, uh, um, we are using uh, materials that is uh, very raw and uh, not uh, as elaborate as many of the other mosques that you see uh, overseas on a very ornamented uh, mosque and very uh, straightforward and simplified. Uh, this is also to a mosque that we, we propose uh, for steer alarm. And here we use more of the traditional roof form. Uh, this is actually to express the uh, Bugis uh, architecture uh, uh, mosque in, in Selangor. This mosque was, uh, uh, proposed in Selangor, so you can see that uh, uh, parking is a, a big deal here. So you have parking on the ground, the mosque is elevated, and multi-purpose hall uh, is also uh, um, well sought after because of weddings and uh, having events. Uh, so uh, that's incorporated to many of the larger size mosques. And you can see from here, from the open space over uh, at the plaza, uh, overlooking and the minaret is now no longer a concrete minaret it's all lightweight prefabricated metal uh, you uh, built it in the factories and you install it within a day uh, uh, as as one can say it's either the dome or the minaret or the arch to define the mosque so if you have to choose one of those even the uh, minaret that we use i mean the arches that we use are also uh, defined differently. It's not your traditional uh, arches that you use eh? and that you see uh, in, in the Western countries. It's more of the pointed arches, pointed and, uh, um, I don't know, uh, more of a uh, different sort of Islamic architecture. This is another vernacular mosque. This mosque is actually about 100 over years old. What happened was um, it was abandoned about 20 years and uh, someone asked me to help to try to save it. So uh, you spend about two years just to get it, the whole the approval to move it to more of a, uh, a, a taman. Eh? Taman is like a housing development and place the mosque and, and give it a new life after 20 years it's been abandoned. So this mosque uh, has uh, shown the, uh, the vernacular um, approach of the mosque eh? so that it has large windows, airy, cheap, Double tier, uh, pre medical roof, you know, and then you have this badok, the drum, where you call for prayers. And it's elevated. Those days, this mosque was located in, in next to a river, so it's uh, elevated so that uh, if the water rises, it doesn't enter the mosque. But it, the reason why uh, the mosque was abandoned is because it was near the river. All the kampung folks has to move, but they left the mosque and it was deteriorating and then. Uh, I, I like the mosque because it hasn't got any extension. As you know, uh, uh, as the population grows, the mosque will be will be um, what you call it will be demolished and built um, in, a, in a larger con in a larger mosque will be built on the site, and the old older mosque will be demolished. 
So uh, sustainability was a big thing. Uh, even now, previously it was 2015. So this is the first uh, we had this uh, platinum moss, first uh, platinum moss, uh, GBI platinum moss in Sabajaya. It's uh, currently uh, our, um, the second largest moss in Selangor. It can be about eight over thousand uh, people. It's on a 13 uh, eight site. And it's actually the, the why why it's positioned this way is because there was supposed to be an Islamic um, university uh, by Sabajaya, but it never been built. So, but the planning was approved. So we had to uh, find a space in between the the shape, the oval shape, to place the mosque. So it has a mosque. Uh, it has a multi-purpose hall, which is separate from the mosque, and then the Imam and Bilal. Uh, uh, place, uh, place to say stay and uh, also uh, parking. Uh, so it's not uh, parking for the whole uh, 8,000 people, but uh, a reduced the number of uh, parking. And it also has an Islamic garden and it was designed to incorporate all the sustainability, water harvesting, solar panels, uh, materials that is recyclable. Uh, this is the first uh, introduction how to do to, to, to use sustainability into a mosque. So I can see So I can see the plan. Uh, it has a courtyard mosque. I wanted to design uh, a courtyard mosque for this. Uh, we wanted to design and also the overspill. And area, the main prayer hall is air conditioned. It can fit about a thousand people, and the rest is uh, open uh, open space. And on the side, on the left hand side, is the multi purpose hall. And on the bottom is the Islamic garden because there's the uh, one thing that the Sultan of Salah wanted is before you enter the mosque during a Ramadan, people can hang up under the minaret. And uh, by the users before going to the mosque and uh, other mosques, it was asked to be put a dome, so we can dome. And this is how it was. It will eventually be like the dome is a first class, uh, totally glass dome, and you have to do a triple uh, layered dome, uh, triple glass uh, dome. And the minaret is you know, steel, and below the minaret, because uh, normally minaret you build the minaret is uh, of no function. What we did was we had the evolution below, and you can see with all the trees, it's going to be a uh, yeah, yeah. garden. So, this is how the picture goes uh, at the early in the morning. At this umbrella with roofs. Uh, and one thing that we wanted to do is before you enter the mosque, you must take your evolution. Uh, and this is a rather than have a separate room or a toilet to do an evolution, we, we put it out. But before the mosque, before entering to the mosque, that's what you can see on the top right is the evolution, top left evolution, and on the on the right side is how the minaret, and you can see that below the minaret is the evolution. So the minaret doesn't is uh, doesn't uh, exist as a just as a sculpture form. It has a function as well, and it has a cover because as you know, uh, we have a very hot weather, and also it rains. So someone who wants to take the evolution is, is already well protected. And the, uh, this is not the original, uh, what we designed, but the Sultan at that particular time, this, uh, and the President uh, Sultan wanted it to um, have timber as the uh, mihrab wall, uh, and just to give, uh, you know, to keep the tradition of using wood and using gold leaf for the ayat. So that won't uh, fade over time, and timber for the mint bar as well. And we use water as a cooling agent right in front of the wall, so that when the winds blow, it will cool down. Even the carpet is as uh, because this is at Sabajaya. Sabajaya is actually at Majlis Sepang, or the province of Sepang, which has a flower of the. Um, uh, red flame. So uh, we use the flower, the red flame, as a motif on the floor on a carpet.
as you can see, this is the interior and the, the glass dome is all right on the top. And, uh, and the green, uh, green um, carpet is used uh, and, uh, and the stuff is identified by uh, little, little flowers onto the, on the carpet. And below the main dome is the, the flower of the sepang uh, uh, motif. And in, in many of my uh, our mosques, uh, we like to put a signature tree. And the signature tree that we always use is Bunga Tanjung. Um, this Bunga Tanjung is a medicinal and scented trees. And it has grown, uh, this has taken some way back, but it has grown very big now. And I'm very happy the last time. I'm going there tomorrow. When, uh, for Friday prayers, uh, but I, uh, because I have a meeting there. So I would like to see, because it's something that uh, uh, my try and error. Actually, the, the oh, yeah, because the, the uh, moss is a bit long, so uh, it allows for uh, lighting and also ventilation. Uh, and, and, uh, also, uh, and also, you know, people would like, because there's a lot of universities and, and, and uh, schools there, so a lot of people will come and become a resting area uh, uh, while waiting, waiting and resting area. Uh, so this is how it looks like at night. This is on the left is the water body in, and uh, facing the mirror wall. So in our experiment to pool, uh, the, the doors can be open and the uh, water can act as a cooling agent. And uh, one thing that I didn't realize that uh, at that particular time is that the uh, yeah, it's very, Popular here because uh, during Tarawih pray prayers, they bring their kids uh, because the kids normally don't pray. They use this as a playground for them. You know, they run around while the uh, parents are praying inside, and it's a safe place, so they're not too worried where the kids are. This is a picture from below the dome, the glass dome, and you have, you have uh, right in the rosette in the, at the center is actually covering the a big fan, the big S fan. So you can pull. Uh, actually, it's also an extractor. You will uh, you will extract uh, hot air um, uh, from from below to above. Hot air rises. So this is the dome, and the next one is something similar. It's also in Kota Kumuning, and you have the commission. As you can see on the left, we have an um, overspill area where we just put slab and also trees. So that if that's needed to be in the future, they don't need to the physical extension. Then people can pray uh, under the trees whenever it's possible. Like it doesn't rain. Uh, it's almost completed. It's supposed to open this month, but I think uh, some uh, uh, procedural matter is not uh, in line yet. But it will open somewhere in, in September and probably end of August or early September. So some of the contemporary uh, contemporary design that we did also, this is a Tibet or like a, a vocational school university where the mosque, uh, we, we had to fight very hard to put the mosque right in the center. I think Razin, uh, Razin is actually uh, from my school uh, in, in the US. And it's actually a model from LSU where you, know, you have a center courtyard with all the buildings. With uh, uh, surrounding the courtyard, and it, and we have uh, uh, a um, covered walkway to walk from one building to another building. So uh, as you can see, uh, the mosque that we did was uh, uh, circular in shape, elevated. So that uh, below of uh, the mosque, uh, there's a surau, is a sheltered place. That, you know, then if it rains or you need a rest, you can rest, and so you don't have to go to the top. And to access, you have a staircase and also a ramp for handicap. Uh, it's actually under construction has because of COVID has been stopped and uh, you know stop start stop start until now it's going to start again. And now this is how it looks like. Uh, hopefully, it's going to complete soon. Uh, and we also use again the minaret. Um, uh, I like to use minaret with uh, with the use of metal. It's easy to build and uh, uh, start replicated the factory and it's installed within a day. Uh, this is another mosque, a contemporary mosque, uh, Damasar Pradana. This is actually a design proposal. 
So again here, um, like all the walls are PMO, PMO well, where you can have cross ventilation into the in the mosque and it's protected uh, from rain and sun, so that uh, is a con uh, is a, always be cool uh, by only the main prayer hall is uh, normally air conditioned uh, because of. Uh, um, only during Fridays that uh, is filled up. This is a small surau, uh, about five, about three to five hundred people. Uh, again, uh, we try to uh, uh, do something that is different, but not far away from something that is uh, you can't uh, truly understand. And, uh, and it's it's just a surau, and uh, using a ventilator box, a ventilator uh, ventilator blocks because they only have about 500,000 ringgit to this model. So, and, and we had gone several design uh, processes to ensure that we, we can meet the client's uh, budget. So at the end of the day, uh, we have it uh, just ventil ventilation blocks and also uh, louvers uh, uh, behind it, just in case uh, at night, uh, you know, you have uh, insects uh, coming in, you can always close. If someone, um, this is very, very, uh, uh, it happens occasionally where someone wants to donate an uh, um, air condition, is then uh, you have to close your windows or you have to close up the ventilation blocks. So in this in this area, we, we, we find that uh, uh, you better put in some louver windows so that if someone wants to put as a, con a condition later on, they don't have to uh, change the exterior of the building. Uh, another uh, proposal that we did uh, and how uh, we use this lower dome in the courtyard in the middle. Uh, and this is another mosque, it's in Kuala Pila. Uh, how we uh, try to use uh, an agris milan, uh, is, which is uh, it, it means uh, nine states uh, in, a, in a state. So we have a nine uh, uh, sided uh, building. Uh, it becomes like this. Uh, so it becomes into a, uh, 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 a mosque that reflects the state. So all this uh, also the minaret again, uh, we use a uh, metal minaret uh, and also a, a cola or evolution trough, water trough, right in the center. So that we can take um, uh, the evolution and uh, out in the open. And uh, again, there's also a tree right in the middle, which is uh, Bunga Tanjong. This is the, actually one of the earlier mosques that we did. Actually, it's actually located next to Putrajaya. It's in Putrajaya next to uh, the, uh, they have a big Taman Selatan, a big grave, uh, graveyard area for uh, different uh, religion. So all religion will have a structure and uh, we can't call this a masjid or a surah, so they call it a musala. It works very well because it becomes a shelter, it becomes a place, a wait, uh, waiting place. It also becomes, uh, as you can see here, there's a what uh, on the left-hand side. Right in the center, there is a, a outside evolution so that uh, it's, you can use it as a, as a uh, washing after after um, attending to the uh, burial and because sometimes it gets muddy and you want to pray after that but you can wash outside and so it was very it worked well in that sense uh, this is something that uh, uh, I, I I did uh, on a land that I uh, belonging to my uh, grandfather which uh, was a rubber plantation which I converted into a uh, durian plantation and also a Airbnb. So in in in, uh, in in terms of to uh, respect my late parents, um, I built a, a surau. So the surau is actually a three triangle. This is a whole land. It's about six acres. As you can see, the dotted uh, triangles uh, inter, inter, integrated together uh, uh, is the surau. So you can see that the surau, the front part will be the uh, male and the uh, behind uh, will be the female. We have also, uh, at, at that particular time, uh, hopefully that the tree uh, can grow right in the middle of the existing tree. But apparently, uh, we couldn't do that. 
So the tree is no longer there. And this is how it looked like. It's very open. Uh, so uh, very, um, I used, uh, used timber. We use used timber to build the, the moss uh, in, in, in Perak. There's a lot of used timber. As you can see, how the sejada is placed is also during COVID time. So uh, one part of it, I, uh, we use um, uh, louvers, uh, uh, glass louvers in the back portion. We use, uh, in, and now we put um, uh, uh, be dyed or, or uh, lines uh, to prevent water from entering. So uh, one of the things that we did is to study on modular moss. As you know, the problem with moss is that they start growing, and whenever they grow, it it will it will you have to demolish what is existing and you grow. So what? What we did was we tried to experiment the moss. So for 200 person, 400 person, 800 person. So all this modular uh, uh, portion of it will be prefabricated in a factory and can be placed over a weekend. And you can, you know, you can make it into a, a, a larger moss over time. And, and this is how we do it. So we experiment it. We never tried it out. Nobody dares to do it yet. So we're still finding people who are willing to try this. And as you can see, this is a panel as so how the, you know, the water and how the water collected. Because water is a problem here, and how water is collected and uh, dispersed or, or even harvested, uh, and also allowing for uh, ventilation as, as, as this uh, uh, moss will not be fully air conditioned all the time. So all this uh, funnel type building a collect uh, polytype roof will start collecting uh, water and you can expand it you can change it and then you can design it in all the modular form and, and uh, prefabricated in the factory and uh, it'll be something that be quite different one of the things another study that we were talking back to community more so, um, see this is also a study that we did um, uh, because Malaysia is fast becoming an um, uh, aging population. Aging population is 15% uh, of the population will be 60 and above. And as uh, a family who has, uh, and myself, have kids and also uh, elderly parents living, so uh, and also working, sometimes you you have to send your children to school and you, you have to take care of parents. So what we need to do is uh, have something that uh, is a safe place where uh, the uh, children can go, the uh, father, the parents can go, and surrounding it will be schools. Uh, we also have uh, also look at it in the in the sense of uh, cradle to grave, huh? and as you can see towards the uh, uh, side, uh, front side of the mosque is also a graveyard, huh? like the traditional, uh, like the traditional. Uh, a mosque in the past where you have a graveyard uh, next to the mosque. So you have universities, you have schools, you have primary, secondary schools, you have uh, also uh, accommodation as well. So what, what I think in, 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 in short is that whenever you send your kids and your parents, you just send, send to one place. Now we've grabbed or even they have your own taxis that older, older uh, parents can, or older children can, um, uh, probably go back using Grab or even uh, the uh, community bus uh, supplied by the by the mods. So so it will be uh, uh, not too heavy on the on the on the uh, family you know, if you have to take care of your small kids as well as your elderly parents. You can you can rest assured that uh, uh, that they are in a safe place, and it's also be uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, well protected with uh, security guards and people looking after uh, uh, the community. So, this, so you get uh, a lot of uh, childcare center, yeah, recreational, old folks, indoor sports center, maternity hospital, multi-purpose hall. You know, all this. You have an IMRT station. So, all this uh, also very important to for the community to function well so that it will, it will lessen the stress of uh, 
uh, of a, a unit, a family unit, having to take care of so many things and, and have to go to work. It's also a cradle of the grave, so you have your Mandi Janaza place, or you know, to to uh, wash the bodies, and also the grave that uh, goes by. Uh, so that's so how it is. Uh, it's also based on the modular moss as well. Um, and it's like uh, eventually as it grows. Some of our unbuilt works uh, uh, moss. We enter uh, quite a bit of architecture uh, moss uh, competition. And I just show you some. Uh, one of the earlier ones was a uh, uh, what they call it the Chinese moss, uh, and this is how we we define. We were shot this study didn't win, uh, so um, we use red color. And also, the it's not a uh, calligraphy. It's just a pattern. On the exterior, and there's a uh, you know self shading uh, because of the shape uh, of the glass, so uh, that we won't get the direct heat to heat up the glass inside. So this is a, a Chinese uh, interpretation of a Chinese moth, a modern Chinese moth. This is a medical moth uh, competition that we entered. We didn't win. Uh, we shortlisted them. Uh, and how it is so because uh, we follow the site it's triangular uh, inside so we, we base that uh, shape of the site and, and uh, follow the shape of the building so this is how it is how it looks like a minaret and a big arch in the center and also again the skin of the building is also uh, able to uh, be able um, to, to be um, uh, fully, you know, uh, the, the uh, air can go through. Another competition in Dubai. This is Dubai Creek. I don't know any, how many people have entered it, but uh, we did not win this competition, but it's a good experiment, uh, something that to stretch our mind and something that is uh, can be uh, something else. This is uh, based on a shell and how the moss could be uh, uh, interpreted in a different manner. And how it can be located by by the uh, sea, and also have a uh, landing platform for others to come in through through boats uh, to the to, to the mosque. And uh, how this is um, because we have we designed two mosques in one side, eh? so that one is nearer to the land and one is to the sea. So this is how it looks like, and this is the Dubai Creek uh, Tower. Right in the center, as you know, it's a Clara Traba is now designing it. I don't know whether they're going to complete building it. Uh, recently, uh, a most competition in Saudi. Uh, again, uh, we, we in a way we use back what we did for Kuala Pila, but in this in, in this context, we use it as a, a Bedouin tent. Uh, as you know, in uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, uh, actually uh, started from Bedouins, and the other one is the uh, cube uh, reflecting the Kaaba. So is how uh, all these mosques are all, uh, about five hundred uh, to a thousand people. So you know we have to design to fit the weather. As you know, uh, in Saudi Arabia is a different. A lot more different than in Malaysia. It's very hot uh, at, at times. And always is moss. Uh, uh, what we did was uh, more on uh, uh, having landscaping uh, and water and oasis and also a uh, wind, wind tunnel, wind, you know, to cool the spaces below. And even if we try to experiment and a courtyard in the front, even if we're ex trying to experiment. Uh, using underfloor cooling rather than underfloor heating uh, uh, to cool the space during uh, the hot, hot months and the shell. Uh, as uh, as uh, we had to we, we had to submit three options uh, and the shell is empty to to reflect Dan Daman as a as a fishing village and also previously they collect a lot of shell uh, shellfish and also oysters. Yeah. This is the same as it's now. We're using uh, the, the the theory of uh, gold ratio theory uh, uh, to design the box. 
at Bayat Mosque using uh, the uh, the tower uh, to the spaces inside. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to learn all this uh, new new uh, you know uh, new approaches in different countries and how you how you would approach it or how I would approach it in terms of designing uh, mosques. Bedouin ten again. And, and uh, the Oasis Mosque, how it looks like, and uh, you know, as you enter, uh, oh yeah, it's very, very big in in the in, in the Middle East, and uh, Oasis is uh, is also uh, a generate to generate light, and also uh, have a landscape uh, incorporated into the building. So uh, another one is a shell. We are trying to experiment a building that is uh, roundish. Shape, oh, like to pull uh, around uh, circular in shape. So inside is all white, and outside is uh, built in um, either in the um, clay uh, um, bricks. So okay, towards the end now, uh, like like uh, the Cairo was mentioning, we did quite a bit of um, publication. This is when I I was a uh, uh, trying to learn a lot about mosque architecture, and we, we, at that time we were doing quite a bit of mosque. So we, 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 me and my partner Zukaiza also, um, you know, come up with a dream design brief and guidelines, and, and you know what we learned and how was the size, and you know, in terms of one star, uh, even evolution, taking evolution, and, and how how it is, and and also um, uh, different types of. Um, uh, um, screens that uh, allow ventilation as well to come in. This is all the books that we did. Uh, uh, we started off with the uh, World Moss, which is the brown one on the left. Uh, world, uh, all the world, um, known world moss uh, in the world. And then uh, we, we did uh, uh, an exhibition at uh, Islamic Museum is uh, for Masjid Nagara when it turned 50. And uh, below that is the green color. Uh, the green color cover is the uh, Slapuk Mosque uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Baharudin, it was my uh, boss previously when we were, when I was working in Jurubena. So he did about 10 really nice mosques, 10 state mosques, or 8 or 10 state mosques. So we, we did that. And on the uh, right hand side to the top is future moss. We collected moss from around the world. We contacted some of the people that that we saw in their work. And uh, there's two volumes. One of the volumes is uh, we compiled it and made it into a book. It's all a digital book, and it's you can buy print on demand from Amazon. And below is our experience doing the Mamali moss. How we we have to dismantle the moss. Uh, I did the did lab study, dismantle the moss and move it uh, to somewhere near Gipo. Uh And it's, it's, been, it's, it's already still in use after five years. And recently, uh, we were appointed by ECRDC not to do the architecture, but to do the book on the, on the, uh, on the moving of the Kampung Laut Moss. As you know, uh, 50 years back, there was a big... Uh, um, uh, flood that almost destroyed the mosque. And during that time, Mubin Shepherd and also uh, Hamdan Taihe were, or Tun Hamdan Taihe were, uh, were in the um, uh, historical society. So move it to Nilampuri. Only recently, two years back, they wanted to bring it back to Kampung Laut. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't do the uh, moving, but we did the boat. A lot of history that we learned, and uh, we did uh, hire a good photographer, and uh, the drawings is done by Zul Kaiser, and uh, and uh, the book's about two hundred fifty. It's almost going for print. Tomorrow we have to do our last edit. <coughs> by end of the month, uh, we have to take uh, final beauty shots, and off it goes to the printers. So uh, uh, it is a. Uh, so very very difficult to do a book, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, through a community. So something that I might not want to do in the future. <laughs> okay, I think that's about all. Uh, 
uh, I think I pass it back to Dr. Carol. Dr. Carol. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Architect Ajazib. Uh, what a what a wonderful way of expressing your your work, uh, and it's it's very colorful, and I, it's it's going it's just going moving forward and forward and forward. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, I I have to reserve my comments uh, because this is a public uh, uh, session. So uh, we will have uh, uh, the Q and A for uh, with regards to your work uh, presented uh, later after uh, Architect Zainab's uh, uh, session. <laughs> So yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Bear with us, uh, architect Ajazim. All right. So we quickly move on to um, architect Zainab. Uh, yes. Are you ready? Uh, but yes. before yes, but before that, let me just introduce you. You Please. are assistant professor, at School of Art and Design and Architecture at uh, NUS T University, or National Institute of Science and Technology in Islamabad, Pakistan. You are an alumni of AA in London Architecture Association, where you graduated with. Uh, MA in Housing and Urbanism in 19, uh, sorry, in 2018, has been lecturer and assistant professor at NUS since 2019. Among the accolade that you have within the academic field is actually the conferment of the distinction of master's station at AA School of Architecture, entitled uh, Redeeming Urban Childhoods on Questions of the City and Child's Right to the City, Slum Childhoods and the Role of Design, which is a very interesting socially driven topic that you have there. Okay, but without further ado, uh, let us invite uh, uh, Assistant Professor uh, uh, Zainab Javid to pre present us with a very interesting topic called Architecture of Simultaneity. That's the first time I've heard it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Architect Professor Zainab Javid, yeah, all yours. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for a very kind introduction. Um, I would just like to confirm that uh, you can view my screen, perhaps? Yes, uh, we are clear with that, yes. All right, wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude for having been given this opportunity uh, to speak amongst such an accomplished and worthy panel of architects and scholars and offer my two cents on the subject at hand, which is mosque architecture. I'm sure I speak for the entire audience in saying that indeed the presentations so far have been incredibly thought provoking um, and the expert knowledge that has been offered is profound and therefore incredibly meaningful for all those joining today and myself. Um, the presentation today, uh, I shall be combining my observations and learnings from the urban landscape of a couple of cities that I've had the privilege of having lived in. Primarily the capital of my home country, Islamabad, and London, where I spent a year for my master's. I expressed myself through photographs of the presentation in the following slides is consumed by images extracted from friends from the web and those I have taken myself. Um, I would also like to add that perhaps the most fruitful, fruitful part of this exchange and opportunity is learning how architectural practice um, and the thought and the meaning behind it is different across cultures and geographies. While my observations are limited to places I am familiar with, there is interesting discourse that happens at moments like this, where each of us sheds light on a similar theme from distinct cultural perspectives. In the spirit of this, I look forward to showing you some fragments of mosque architecture as found in Islamabad, as we discuss the concept of simultaneity in architecture and its relevance to mosque design. I've been observing the question, uh, sorry, the chat section, and it's very interesting to see that some of the questions that have been asked and some of the points that have been raised by the architects that have presented prior to me are already quite relevant and speak about the social sort of um, inclusion or exclusion or the unfolding of the core function or the core religious program that is assigned to most typologies. To summarize, the premise of my argument um, is perhaps to speculate the singularity of purpose assigned to current mosque typologies, um, building on certain case studies uh, of broad religious spaces, starting with churches. The purpose of this argument is to recognize that the 21st century uh, city dweller uh, is not only a spiritual subject, but a more amalgamated product of a wider discourse of interests, ambitions, pursuits, and needs. Uh, not to mention that the fast-paced lives we lead, we really cater to a single interest of ours at a time. We often so strive to be... Uh, architect Zainab, are, you, uh, is your, are your slides uh, moving? Uh, uh, I am slide? I'm still at the first slide. All right, okay, sorry about this. I will move forward in a minute, sorry. Um, so, come back, uh, 
Regarding the productivity that we strive to induce in our daily lives, we tend to often engage multiple traits of our personalities at once. Now, the question is, how does this understanding of the modern day individual then affect the programmatic matrix assigned to religious spaces, especially mosques? And how might the induction of a programmatic mix enhance or uphold the core religious function of a mosque? So on the first slide, the image um, is perhaps recognizable to some. It, it is the Seattle, it's a diagram of the Seattle Public Library by OMA. And the sort of abstract representation here of the intuitiveness of design, uh, the intuition that is the sort of the intuition, um, sorry, the design that is largely intuitive instead of programmed, heavily programmed and heavily uh, discreetly marked, demarcated with walls and rooms and so on and so forth, um, is perhaps an interesting representation for the concept on its own. Now, the architecture of simultaneity, as I call it, is perhaps not an entirely foreign subject, for it also has been brought up in part in other terms that we use in the architectural sort of jargon, like hybridity, third space, flexible spaces, multipurpose spaces. So they all embody sort of this sort of a similar concept. However, um, the thought behind the architecture of simultaneity is that places that ambiguously integrate a multitude of organizations uh, tend to appeal to different disciplines within a single building genre. These kind of buildings become more enabling and relevant to how most of us lead our lives today. We are incredibly mobile individuals, constantly on the move, doing things in places that are not necessarily built or designed to accommodate those respective activities. Things have become more perhaps closely associated than before. We live and we work in proximity. We detest zoning practices. We hybrid our buildings and we monetize creative competitions of dis combinations of disparate activities. We are a society of liberated individuals fighting conservative ideals of over-regulated, over-determined, stratified social orders. For the most part, we condemn social discrimination, stratification, and segregations. These social agendas um, extend to how we conceive and inhabit spaces, both civic and private. Is there an issue with the screen, perhaps? Yeah, uh, we are seeing the Windows uh, applications. This is not my um, desktop, however, so this is perhaps somebody else's. Somebody else has, uh, has shared his or her screen. Uh, yeah, uh, to the audience, uh, any one of you actually sharing uh, your screen rather than uh, uh, architect sign up screen? Can somebody? Uh, uh, I, I can try yeah, again try now. Again. Yes, yeah. Apologies. Apologies for that, yeah. No problem. I believe it is visible again. Yes, yes. Right. All right. So um, as I was speaking of the sort of social agendas and how they extend to how we conceive and inhabit spaces, both civic and private, the architecture of our cities is very evidently a manifestation of this contemporary culture. Um, this condition of simultaneous activities is further exaggerated um, by perhaps the overuse um, of the smartphone with its navigating capabilities, endless applications to organize and document our lives, and the sheer possibility to do several things at once while in commute, at a coffee shop, or at work. It sort of got people accustomed to doing things simultaneously, and inevitably, it is urbanity that followed. The Interesting thing about this image from um, a bridge crossing Thames in London is that the number of devices, if you, the, the, the longer you look at it, the more devices and wires sort of plugged into ears or headphones are revealed to you um, as you sort of see deeper into the horizon of the image. Um, moving forward, so I will begin by speaking about the religious spaces in general. And for that, I take the precedent of two church examples from London. Uh, both of these buildings are a three minute walk located at a th three minute walk from one another located in sort of the heart of central London in the borough of Bloomsbury. Um, although both are 19th century establishments, while one of them suggests that it's a 1960s church, the truth is that the, the 
Lumen United Church was initially built in the uh, mid 19th century. However, it was during the Second World War uh, seriously damaged as a result of the bombing and therefore reconstructed in the 1960s. Now, what you see in front of you is a further rendering of it or a refurbishment of it that was done by Thiessen Khan in 2008. It is an award, a RIBA award winning building. And the comparison of two buildings in such prox proximity that hold the same process, uh, the hold the same promise of servicing, servicing a community's faith, um, the complexity of one against the other is in fact quite uninteresting. Um, the Lumen Church has evidently evolved and reevaluated its, its relationship to people and the faith over time, while the Holy Cross Church on the right hand side uh, maintains its somewhat archaic logic as a religious institution, as well as its architectural qualities. Now, now each through the architectural language, in fact, uh, build this comparison. The Holy Cross building is reminiscent of a Gothic revival architecture, and the Lumen Church is a very contemporary building, not only visually, but also, and this is really important, it is contemporary in its logic of space, provision, and its specific organization within a building genre. So with reference to these experiences from London, I want to speak about how a reformed, uh, how a transformed religious institute became an active site for social activity outside the hours of weekly mass and in how it invited people from all race, class, age groups, and most importantly, from diverse religious backgrounds, owing to its simultaneity or the simultaneity of programs within it. Uh, coming on to the case study of the Lumen United Reformed Church House, what the church promises is sort of to create a new church and community center open to people of all faiths. Now, what you see in front of you are certain images taken from the website of the Lumen Church, where you see cafes populated with people socializing over lunch break. You see a gallery populated with the work of local artists as people observe while also lounge with a, maybe a deli sandwich and so on. You see a senior citizens meeting happening in a quiet, tranquil garden at the back, which was a refurbishment of the previous car park area, and you see um, a homemade jam on sale from a local vendor. So this really speaks to how fluid the program of the religious, of an otherwise religious building can become whilst maintaining the sanctity of its sort of more sacred uh, program as well. Now, if we come to the plan, now, the spatial organization, uh, I would like to ask if my cursor can be seen by the audience. All right, fantastic. Now, the spatial organization, as seen in the plan of the building, establishes a relationship between the sacred spaces um, that are found not surprisingly at the core of the building within the additional amenities sort of wrapping around it. Now, the reception at the streetwork corner of the plot, it collects and distributes visitors over and across this cafe or down the gallery onto other spaces. The reception area and the cafe, the naturally lit gallery and the garden at the back, all of these are elements that structure this interplay of social, religious, layer and work-related activities and all the other amenities um, latch onto this, con this continuous sequence of spaces spanning the depth and the width of the building. Through visual and physical extensions onto and across this armature, all rooms and niches in the building become related and continuous. Now, the northern elevation, as you see here, it sits on Tavistock Place with the most public function, the cafe being foremost, and the religious spaces inside, however, pushed back towards the farther end. Now, this gradation that we see sort of preserves the qualities of the church space while maintaining an engaging facade of the public for the public to sort of spark interest. Now, advertised as being a source for the community, uh, again, a few images that I'd like to share from their own events and from their own website. Um, so advertised as a source for the community, the church still maintains sort of the skeleton of its past. It maintains the crypt downstairs. It maintains the church tower. However, um, it builds upon it to make a model that is more fitting for the modern day individual. Now, the success of this model is that it sees the house of worship as an opportunity. 
and it extends the concept of congregation to our social work, social and work lives as well. It allows one to come to church not only to offer prayer, repent for one's sins or join mass, but also to engage and socialize with friends, colleagues, finish off, on a, finish off on a work report or visit an exhibition showcasing a local artist's work. All of this while enjoying the delights of warm coffee and deli sandwiches at the cafe. Um, I would at this moment like to point out that the, the church space, while is sort of concentrated where um, members of the church collect for mass and for sermons, um, on the center uh, in between what is the cafe and the uh, church space is what they refer to as a sacred space or a quiet space. Now, this core um, sort of element is meant to be a space of reflection, um, which is very neutral and does not align with any singular religion, allowing for people from all religious backgrounds to be able to reflect for those who might have not might not have mosques in the community for those that might not have you know, sort of tailor-made spaces for their cultural, for their religious beliefs, this becomes a place of reflection and a place of sacred sort of um, energy, perhaps. Now, um, I had the opportunity to speak to, and this gets very interesting because it sort of speaks to the practicality of an architect architectural solution of the sort. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to Diane Brown, um, a, a lady who worked at the cafe of the church, and she suggested that the congregation of the church itself, which is a handful of people, has not been growing for a few years. Now, these people obviously belong to a single demographic group and are all senior citizens with none of the younger members of the com community joining mass or visiting the church for its sacred function. Um, as a result, what she said was that the church was dying on its feet and it cannot produce on its own the funding necessary to run the facility. Now, although this might not have been the reason for the church to have established to have been established the way it has been now, the presence of these additional amenities has helped, in fact, sustain the building and the religious spaces and therefore uphold the institution. So to dovetail um, other ambitions is perhaps the best way to describe how architecture can be, uh, you know, more, 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 more of a problem solver while also maintaining other ambitions. So it's this this prior sort of um, this parallel sort of uh, ambitions here for the architects, for the community at large, for the people that run this establishment, for the prior community um, that has had been sort of patrons of the church. And so the simultaneity of these agendas is also far it's incredibly interesting to see. Now. To sort of narrow into religious spaces, uh, to narrow into mosques uh, as religious spaces, uh, I borrowed these images from my brother-in-law who had the experience of attending a Bori sort of wedding um, at what is known as a Bori Jamaat Khana. And this particular example is from Karachi uh, in Pakistan. Um, it's interesting to see that there are already precedents of how mosques have started expanding or have since a long time expanded their function to cater to more than just a religious function. Now, I see that these kinds of examples ex exist, especially in areas where people of faith are not a majority. Um, we see that mosques abroad or in countries where there isn't a Muslim majority, they do seem to extend beyond their obvious religious function. Um, the duplicity of the mosque as a center for the community and the pairing of the religious function with the social one does not does something that is what this thesis tries to unfold. Now, why do community, what do community centers mean for people in foreign non-Muslim majority countries? Now, these become slides, what I assume is that they become sites for collective activity, which is something more complex than the sole act of congregation. Now, with reference to the Bori Jamaat Khana, um, it caters to the Bori community uh, and it becomes more than a site for Salah. These establishments function as a culture and, as culture and religious centers. And what you see are images from a community wedding hosted at this community center, which features a vast array of activities that are both ceremonial or related to dining and so on and so forth. So perhaps there are already nuanced examples within present, present mosque architecture that sort of unfolds um, the religious at uh, the core aspect of mosques to become more accessible, more inclusive, and perhaps more facilitative to a larger uh, public or a broader sector of society. Now, I would like to bring your attention to 
what is uh, perhaps a key landmark in the city of Islamabad, uh, the Faisal Mosque. Now, to my 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 presentation does not have much to do with the sort of the architectural details of this space. Um, it is instead more concerned with, or it's sort of more. Um, it has more to do with how the public and the community and the people that use these spaces tend to claim them or then to utilize them. And so that is the part of it that I will also be focusing on going forward. Um, so to briefly introduce the Faisal Mosque, it is um, it was designed by a Turkish architect, Vedat Dalakoy, Dalukay, sorry. And it is sits on about a site which is about 33 acres of land and it is sort of a fusion of both Islamic and um, contemporary architecture. Now the architect sort of refers the Bedouin tent in the form of the um, mosque but also sort of had um, to some extent in a very abstract manner alluded to the geometry and the proportions of the Kaaba as he constructed the four minarets that sit on each of the corners of the main prayer hall. So to think about the role that this landmark or this mosque has for the city of Islamabad, it is the very obvious function, the first and foremost of the mosque, a space for religious congregation. But more than that, it also becomes a landmark in the capital and that grabs attention and value to it of sorts. And it also draws in both public and sort of both the local public and tourists from other parts of the country, as well as outside the country. Most importantly, it becomes a public space to all. I would like to quote a fellow um, architect and colleague here who speaks about this mosque as almost as an object and says, people from different sectors and different economic classes visit the park in which the mosque is situated. They lounge in the grass surrounding the mosque, soak up sun in winters and nap in summer afternoons under the trees, spending a day out with a monument in the city. And to be able to have something of such value um, both locally and internationally, for if nothing else, it is a very proliferated image attached to the nation um, and to the country of Pakistan to have something of that value be so accessible and so integrated into the society at large. And at the same time, maintaining the sacred nature of this religious program is, I think, what sort of it demands our attention under this thesis. Add to this another interesting sort of attribute given to this uh, mosque is that of a ceremonial space where often nikah ceremonies are held and in the aftermath of those ceremonies, the newlyweds often tend to get photographed outside the mosque. And sort of this mosque is sort of sitting at the, at the foot of the green lush Margla Hills becomes a backdrop for memories that will last a lifetime, perhaps. And so to see the broadening or the expansion of this mosque program and the way that it creates more meaning beyond solely the religious um, is of great interest. Um, I added a few images um, of other mosques. I took it upon myself to visit sort of uh, certain close by sectors of Islamabad and observe some of the mosques that I saw and photograph them to be able to draw a proposal. Now, to me, in the following slides, on the, lemon, uh, the images on the left will always be those from Faisal Mosque and the images of the right will interchange other mosques found in close proximity to this landmark. And to me, um, the comparison is rather that of something very lively inhabited and consumed by the public and an alternate sort of image of a very sterile environment um, which does the purpose that it is assigned. But one must question what more can a religious building or a mosque become and how can it service a larger sector of community? Um, how can it service people from all genders, all religious backgrounds? Um, all ages as well. So to wrap up, this culture of simultaneity is not to be looked at as merely an issue of proximity of functions or the agglomeration of relevant programs to achieve a richer whole, because the merit of what comes from considerations of simultaneity is the ability to foster and manage the relationship between and reveal possible synergies across different activities. 
Now we see this with the precedents that we've taken up as the United Reformed Church House and as well as Faisal Mosque. So with the Church House, the parallels help reinterpret a conservative culture and service the community with a wider range of amenities while maintaining its integrity as a preaching institute. And with Faisal Mosque, a stacked landscape mirroring the ascent of the landscape in its background unfolds the core religious function of a mosque, almost diluting it into the larger landscape of public life, ensuring that the site is one that is accessible and inclusive and programmable. Um, as a final note, altogether, this notion can be perceived as being more aligned with the needs and practices of modern society, but there are indeed certain challenges associated with the practice of simultaneity. The most obvious one being the preservation of certain environments when we argue for disparate activities being managed in a concurrent fashion. The more in proximity things become, the greater there is a chance for tensions to arise amongst them, and in more extreme conditions of simultaneously, things do fail owing to this reason. In the varying approaches, only a few of which have been established uh, with the aforementioned precedents, are there any broader synergies and kinds of exchanges that can be fostered to reap greater benefits from this aggregate condition? Um, there I will end my presentation, um, and I hope that even in its sort of arbitrariness and complexity and uh, an ability uh, to sort of capture the entire argument due to lack of time, I hope that it appeals and it raises certain questions across the audience that is joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Zainab. Uh, it's a, it's a, another those uh, thought-provoking ideas. I think uh, you have selected your case studies uh, quite well in trying to express the uh, uh, the the uh, the concepts you know that that you are discussing uh, about. But nevertheless, I think um, we we have uh, uh, yourself and also architect uh, Haji Azim uh, being the, the 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 third and the fourth uh, speakers who who uh, perhaps uh, uh, will have the privilege to actually answer side questions. Um, uh, that is being uh, being uh, provided by by the audience uh, and uh, architect uh, Haji, Haji Azim, yeah. Uh, really, uh, you've seen the uh, the the thread uh, on the on the chat box uh, regarding uh, your your works. So perhaps you might want to point to to a thing or two about about uh, reflecting on the comments, uh, or or should I actually read it up? Uh, then, for example. Um, I put some questions myself, but uh, I, yes. I might give priority to 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 ones other than myself. So in this situation, <laughs> uh, may I read uh, architect T S Mohammad Hamidi? Yes, I I have already answered that. But I, oh, you can did. you read it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, building. Uh, uh, he he has been asking. Uh, building a mosque is like spending a fortune, but the yes. function is too exclusive for daily use. Despite of that, people prefer to install air conditioning to achieve thermal comfort, and again, it will cost another fortune for maintenance. How do you consider that during your design initiation and idea? Uh, going back to the uh, the past, when walls uh, were built, uh, there were no air condition. Air condition is considered as a luxury. So, and there were back in the days when there's no air condition in walls. So only when we already develop and we have, we have, uh, have a taste of comfort. We, we like to be in a uh, in a place where it's comfortable and, and not hot and humid. So uh, we have this problem in the past, and I've already always talked to potential clients that whatever you do, even if you want to reduce price, the air condition uh, has to be where you want to put air condition. Although it's not air condition, you must think of it ahead because there will be someone who is going to be able to donate condition and uh, your building has to be able to adapt to that so that uh, people are going to donate air condition even some people will, will say they'll pay the bills of the uh, uh, mosque so it doesn't cost anything for the mosque so you know uh, because it costs about five with air condition five to six thousand dollars per jamaah uh, a ringgit eh? uh, so uh, you know how much it costs if you, you calculate how many how many people we even have it, this problem right now we're doing a mosque right now which uh, because the budget is about four million and it's about a thousand and then whether we want to put air condition or not air condition so we have to consider that 
And so uh, one thing that we did in uh, in Sabujaya is to put um, a manual saying that uh, okay, yeah, you want only Friday prayers two hours from twelve to two that you can turn on the air condition during the walk to prayers. No air condition. Use the fan. So we install these uh, big ass fans and also stand fans. So there are times they they follow. There are times I saw that they, maybe it was a bit too hot, they uh, turned up the air condition, but that was not the original uh, idea of having the mosque uh, um, uh, not overuse the electricity. So you have to approach from the beginning. And one thing that I'm always advocating is that make sure that your mosque is well ventilated. So you like uh, Wilaya Mosque, because I live nearby, and they have to turn out the mosque 24 hours because there's no windows. <laughs> there's only doors. So if you go and pray in that mosque, you know, you sometimes the temperature is 18 degrees, 17 degrees, or you know, 20 degrees, and you have to wear a jacket uh, to pray. You know, that's a, a waste of money. Uh either for the you know for the country or even for the state. Yeah? So you have to think ahead, you know, the only when you think ahead then you can address the issue. Yeah. Right. Okay. I hope that answered the question. I hope architect TS Mama Razwan is satisfied with your your, your answer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um my personal question on to you earlier on. Yes. Uh yeah. Because because uh, uh, the, the the examples that you've shown are working as a sort of like crescendo of new topology of buildings. Yes. So, so I was asking, I was asking, is there a possibility that one day that you may arrive to a kind of a city mosque that we, so far it's not in Malaysia, you know, uh, that that where it combines, uh, where it where it interacts and it it uh, juxtaposes with many of the elements that is, they are natural, you know. Yes. So, so th there's no stopping you, uh, for example, in in developing new, redefining new. Yeah, it's true because now uh, you have new people, new thinking, and new. Uh, you know, we are more aware, uh, and uh, we we like to include the nature, you know, the context, uh, the people, and and the typology, uh, and will will change. But the way I see it, uh, what, when you do that. Uh, please uh, uh, look into the element of Islamic, you know, like the seven principles that I mentioned earlier on. So try to transfer it into modern day uh, interpretation. So it doesn't, because the last 30 years, from 80s to year 2000, we have been doing copying from everywhere and everywhere. You have the Egyptian mosque, you have the Ottoman mosque, you have the, you know, uh, whatever mosque. Uh, come back we've been uh, architecture differently so it's our opportunity uh, to design a mosque uh, that is has to be relevant to the place that we are, we are build that we are building like here in Malaysia it's hot and humid and tropical and also has to put the element of sustainability solar panels uh, materials that is uh, recyclable, uh, recyclability, and, and also water harvesting, solar, you know, things like that. So the it, other things comes in in line, so that uh, building a mosque will not uh, put a um, bad impact onto the earth, and also in the in, in people's pocket, like have to maintain it. So so at the end of the day, in the typology has to change. For one thing that we yet to see is what typology will stick or is there going to be a separate typology you know we, we, are, we are not we're not we're not certain yet because it's still new uh, I, I believe that it will be a separate typology you can see people are experimenting uh, uh, this approach because climate sustainability will be at the forefront not the domes not the minaret not the arches <laughs> You know, uh, so uh, moving forward, uh, people of the new generation will uh, look at it differently from the past generation of what uh, MOS is going to look like. And it's one thing, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, community-based. 
you know, the, it's, it's not like uh, I'm going to build this mosque five times per year and then that's it. You know, you're going to close the mosque up to that. You know? It has to be more, you know, inclusive because it's such a pity. You know, you build a beautiful mosque, spend millions of ringgit and it's only used for certain times. Uh, and you could use it for other things as well. And praying is also uh, will, will help uh, people when they are going to, oh, okay, now we're going to go pray. It's time to pray. You know, and then you have azan uh, sounding and then, okay, then we can pray because we are within the community. Okay, right. Brilliant. Uh, you, you've got it uh, heading towards somewhere that uh, that's, you know, Something we are looking forward to it. Something in, innovative uh, uh, in terms of the uh, you know, building types and, uh, and quite seriously, I think uh, uh, it is probably the way forward. You know, where you're constantly redefining and re-questioning. You know, uh, the, the 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 issues, the topology of building uh, in light of the current situation. Okay, um, thank you very much, Akte Azim. Now, uh, architect Zainab. I think uh, you have a way with actually explaining <laughs> explaining uh, the the the. The, the issues uh, that that uh, that that you that you are you are dealing with, you know, uh, but but by using the the, the church um, in in UK, uh, it's quite interesting in the way that that you actually you actually uh, uh, discuss discuss it through the language of space, you know, uh, and, and 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 in a way that you actually uh, spaces are evolved from from circulation, you know, uh, gathering of people, you know. What do you see there? I mean, I think uh, it's it's a good way to actually uh, describe. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's always been of interest to me to observe spaces both three dimensionally and in the spatial planning two dimensionally, and sort of attempt to see um, how agendas of an architect or a community, whether it's a, it's a, a sort of star, star building designed by a well-known architect or it's a piece of vernacular architecture. Now, because of my domain largely being with housing, it's very important to understand how domesticity comes about by, you know, how things are placed and how things are structured within the typology of the house. And so that sensibility sort of carries to all other spaces because within themselves, there's a lot of tendencies about the architect, about the intentions behind a project that come to sort of display when you read these spaces and the arrangement and the sort of the complexity in the relationships that there are uh, that are created across different spaces. And so if you think about it, one of the first things then is how closely and how sort of, um, you know, how closely or how, you know, uh, stratified perhaps spaces might be. And so one of the first things during my um, education at Click was, you know, we see a modern culture of really things being condensed into one another. It has to do with multiple processes that are ongoing. Uh, it has to do with higher rental value. It has to do with, you know, the, the the density that we see in central city environments now. But it also has to do with an agenda that is beyond and it's more social, more socially charged perhaps than these numbers and these quantities that we prescribe to the profession. So perhaps that addresses, and it's very kind of you to have described. Okay, uh, one final question for you. This is from Dr. Elisa Grina. If I can sum it up, actually, without without Dr. Elisa asking for it, is that um, how can, what are the elements that, that, form, that, that will enable the architecture of simultaneity to exist the fact that the mosque is also the showcase symbol of Islamic religion, meaning that uh, symbolism is maintained, yet identity. I think I think I I was almost anticipating that question because that is something that has sort of uh, that has come to mind for myself as well as I wrote this research and as I developed this research. And I think that is where the role of the architect comes in. That is the challenge that architecture resolves. Um, it is within houses as well that we put certain things to the front and conceal others towards the back. It is in all kinds of typologies that we're always mediating the relationships between things that are clean and nice and others that are service oriented and perhaps, you know, sort of out of sight and out of mind. 
um, underutilized. So that mediation is constantly ongoing and it's a very key criteria in our profession. And that is where I believe that the architect's role come in to preserve perhaps the, the sacrilegious function. And at the same time, um, sort of reason in a way that it remains unaffected with these parallel simultaneous activities. And the church house or the Faisal Mosque is only one or a couple of ways of handling that issue. But perhaps there are far more that come from understanding the utility of a certain program, um, the, the five times a day of Salah and how the hours around that can be factored in alongside the movement of people and how people circulate across these spaces and how they use them and where they congregate and where they sort of disperse. I think these are all questions that, you know, case by case can be answered by an architect. And I continue to seek a conclusive answer to this, but I am unable to put it in a nutshell. You are an architect, architect Zainab. I am an architect, yes. <laughs> uh, and I wait for the challenge to appear. Yeah. Um, where I can actually take this situation hands on, a situation of this sort, and understand a very specific context and dress it as it is. It is okay. hard to generalize, is what I'm trying to say. Right. Okay. Uh, we actually come virtually to the end of the session, uh, culminating in, in uh, all four expert speakers. So thank you very much, uh, Architect Zainab, for, for your uh, illustration of, of the ideas, concepts behind. And also, um, Unfortunately, we have we have we are short of time, of course. In fact, we have gone on beyond the time given, uh, and but we are safely landing on to six p.m. in Malaysia. Yeah, right? uh, so it is a it is a nice number, nice time, six p.m. So uh, uh, we uh, I think uh, uh, unfortunately we have to we have to put uh, uh, an end to the session for today, right? Hopefully, we can continue in another series of talks. It's a, it's actually a very very wonderful session. Uh, where you 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 have a a a, a variety of uh, topics being discussed uh, and even propositions coming up from virtually from you know literally from from the presentations you know so I think I think it's been a wonderful uh, sessions for both four of you experts uh, 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 speakers uh, most notably the first one architect Haji uh, Razin yeah. Uh, you 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 have put up a, a kind of like uh, the principles. Uh, especially in particular when dealing architecture in dealing with uh, social concerns, right? Uh, and and I think uh, this is this is uh, something that that uh, um, that needs the younger generations of architects, you know, in the future might have to ponder uh, the fact that uh, there are some principles uh, that needs to be uh, uh, you know that needs to be sustained within the the, the architectural uh, practice. Uh, in that sense, we can see the 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 urgency and the the the, the idea of principles uh, that's embedded within your architecture, uh, architect uh, Azim. And these are, are, are notable examples that can be can be provided to the the younger generations of uh, architects uh, uh, in the future. And to Doctor uh, right <laughs> you know, uh, um, I I think I think uh, it's a methodology. The the you know the way that you have actually juxtaposed and compare and contrast uh, uh, examples of uh, of buildings and building topology that exist within the same time frame between uh, ethnicity. I think I think uh, well, well, it's not so much of an ethnic uh, division. It's it's about it's about how do you extract language and knowledge from 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 the juxtaposition of case studies uh, with regards to moss. I think this is a very interesting. Uh, and, and it uh, by doing so, you have actually uh, enlightened us with, with uh, increased knowledge about setting the context, the historical importance of buildings in in, in defining, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, there the, there are palaces, mosques, and there are also common people's mosques uh, 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 by by that definition. So I think I think these are also um, a, a very valuable uh, uh, presentation that you have you are, you have actually uh, presented. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, architect Haji Azim, uh, you, you surprised me the fact that you know um, you know sometimes people will have a, a, a common uh, understanding of of what a modern architectural practice means. You know. Uh, producing more and more high-rise buildings and, and <laughs> not the concern of others. But yet, I think, uh, by the way it's going, 
uh, it, it, has got, it is probably the future, you know, of 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 uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, architectural practice in, in defining more newer and new and better better topologies of building. Uh, in that sense, I, I I think that is a very you know, uh, and finally, uh, architect Zainab, uh, you know, I've learned a lot uh, by using the uh, the you know you've used virtually use uh, a non moss you know, in fact, church. To explain how things might work, because because it's probably uh, the challenges is more to churches than to mosques, and churches are in desperate uh, situations, uh, especially in the West, in the UK. I've been there myself uh, uh, for about fifteen years in the UK. So so I think I think uh, uh, it is a uh, lessons lessons needs to be served uh, to 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 the to the to the bigger world, especially to the Muslim world. Who are still in dealing with uh, you know uh, the conventional way of expressing, uh, interpreting the mosque. So we have from a uh, combination of all four of uh, of you, uh, you know, the way forward to actually deal with this situation is the fact that uh, mosque has uh, uh, borrowing your words. The fact that there are more opportunities than there are uh, inhibitions about mosque uh, uh, de uh, design and development. So I think this is something that that. Um, that uh, that is a, 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 a motivation for new generation architects to actually explore this, you know, capitalize this, the possibilities of more more variations, more uh, diversity in the way that you express uh, most. So I think uh, with that, uh, well, I probably won't sum up enough any of your <laughs> your presentation, but but uh, certainly I think we leave the room open, you know, the session open for future discussions, future dialogues, future discourses. What a wonderful day today! I think, uh, uh, although the topic sounds very conventional, but I think uh, uh, it has expanded into into many many realms. You know? Okay, uh, before we end, uh, uh, thank you very much again on behalf of the Department of Architecture. Well, the Program of Architecture of UTM. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, and um, to to all four of you, uh, Architect Aji Razin, uh, uh, Doctor Urai Ferry Andi, Architect Haji Azim Aziz. And also, finally, Dr. Zainab Javed, you know, uh, and for, for your contributions, uh, we thank you a lot. Uh, we can't thank you enough, uh, but but uh, we do hope to see you again, to meet up again uh, with, with both of uh, with all of you. So uh, before we end the session today, uh, can we arrange for a photo session um, so for those who feel like they want to be in the media? You might as well turn on your 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 cameras, yeah. So 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 now is the photo session. So please, uh, uh, audience uh, and uh, uh, speakers, can you uh, can you switch on your cameras? So uh, I think we have amongst us uh, 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 who are actually Hanif. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So so perhaps you can give the instruction. Okay, uh, one, two, and three, smile. Again, one, and two, and three, smile. Okay. Okay, Hani, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, 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 and uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, we have to, we have to uh, uh, stop for, to, for now, uh, the session. So uh, thank you very much again uh, to all of you. Uh, to 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 the to the panel speakers uh, that that we have invited, uh, we truly appreciate your contribution. And to all participants, I think uh, we hope that we have actually gathered uh, the necessary knowledge, uh, well intended or unintended, uh, and bring it back to to your to your uh, your your world of academia. You know, uh, so that you can expand the knowledge and you can actually work on it. I see here we have Prof Asia. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome and goodbye. Well, not to say goodbye, yeah. But but anyway, Pro Asia is here, and she's one of those uh, uh, that that we always look forward for. Uh, look forward to actually invite her in future series. Okay, thank you very much, all. Uh, hope to see you all again. Uh, and with that, uh, 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 Let's hope we we uh, the best for the future. Okay. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Architect Zainab, thank you, Architect Azim, Architect Razin, and also Dr. Urai. Thank, thank you so you. much. Hope to You're see you welcome. guys soon. Prof. Asia, thank you so much for coming. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Prof. Safi, mm. thank you very much.